Vice Mayor, should we do a sound check? Yes. Can you, I, we heard you, Council Member Spars, I'm assuming you hear us? Yes, thank you, appreciate it. All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order for the afternoon of May 3rd, 2022. Uh, Tony, can we take a roll call, please? Jimenez? Present. Thank you. Prowlis? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Thank you. All right. If you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we are just informed before this meeting about of the passing of um, Norm Mineta. Yes, so I would like to take a, a moment of silence in, in honor and memory of, uh, of Norm Mineta. Thank you. Uh, today's invocation will be provided by Professor Rosanna Alvarez. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco will tell us more. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and uh, my, my condolence, condolences to the entire uh, Mineta family and into our community. We've lost a, a wonderful human being. 
Well, it's, uh, it's May, and I want to say that I've been waiting all year for this because May is my month. So as they say in, uh, in the Latino community, agarrense, means watch out because this is going to be a good month. I'm incredibly honored to present uh, part of my final set of invocations, and I'm very excited today to have uh, Professor Alvarez. I love reflecting on the words of those who help begin our meetings. They set the mood for the day and make us see the world through a new perspective. Let me tell you a little bit about today's invocator, Professor Rosana Alvarez. Besides the fact that I've known her for a very, very long time, a little bit over 20 years, I've known her since she was a very young, uh, young girl, her and her family. Rosana is a multifaceted, interdisciplinary storyteller. She's an educator and she's, pub she's a published author and a poet. She's a native Chicana of East San Jose, the firstborn of nine siblings, a mother of three beautiful and fierce guerreras, a trucker's wife, a perpetual collaborator, an outspoken advocate and poetic orator whose life's work is grounded in her mission to embrace personal power through creative inspiration. As an educator, she's taught at the high school and college levels while also offering a range of professional development workshops and consulting services in partnership with various organizations and individuals throughout Santa Clara County. She has shared spoken word at the San Jose Women's March and on the radio as a keynote speaker for the Santa Clara County Office of Immigrant Relations New American Fellowship and is an ongoing thought partner in several pockets of the county at large. One of her proudest works of art involves her role as the co-founder and editor of Eastside Magazine, through which she remains forever in awe of the power of telling stories by us, for us, and about us, with heart in hand, ink to the page, and allows hollering truths. To convene the experiences, talent, spirit, and voice of our East San Jose community is truly something special. And I'm grateful to Rosana, to Omar, and all those creatives who have devoted themselves to this endeavor. Thank you for listening, and I kindly ask Professor Rosana Alvarez to get us started. Thank you to the Honorable Magdalena Carrasco for having us here with you, and I say us intentionally, and you'll hear why in just a bit. Obviously, I'm always at the ready, and you see that from my awkward standing here during that long introduction. <laughs> but I think that I'm grateful both to Honorable Magdalena Carrasco, the staff, um, and all of the city council members here, and the good citizens of my hometown, San Jose, California. And what a privilege to stand here today after the beautiful show of community celebration in heart that we saw not just through May Day and Viva Calle, but at the reopening of Empire Seven, which stands as a resurrected testament to the resilience of San Jose. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also contextualize the historical significance of Cinco de Mayo as a timeless signifier of belonging. While it remains a chronically misunderstood and slightly misinterpreted quasi non-holiday, it's worth noting the significance of the many, many layers of community and belonging it historically has solidified within a place that values diversity and celebrates cultural difference. As we think about that historical connection that both roots and grounds us across space and time, let us take a moment to reflect on who we carry with us into this work. Let us take a moment to think about all of those people to, that shape our commitment, that constellation of beautiful, complicated people that shape our city, our neighborhoods, our neighbors, our families. As a poet and a danzante, folks sometimes mistaken me from time to time for being a performer. And often I circle back to remind folks that poetry is not a performance, it is the truth of our hearts shared on display. And danza, Aztec dance, is both a prayer and an invocation, 
a call on and for community to show up with dignity, integrity, history, and palabra, or what some folks would understand as quite simply your word. When we consider the nuance involved in that, it requires us to show up relentlessly, sometimes diplomatically, with integrity toward doing right for the ripples of generations impacted by our decisions and actions. And in that way, I suppose I show up as both poet and danzante, even when I leave my feathers and regalia at home. And in some ways, this gathering, this city council meeting, this meeting of strategic minds that carry so much heart and passion into this work is poetry. Because at the root of that is both justice and just us, people. People gathered in connection and sincerity, representing justly the broader cross-section of people, la gente de San Jose. People like my father who built a business in this city people like my grandparents who worked in the fields, the canneries, the electronics assembly lines, people like my mother who worked within the overlooked pockets of education, people like me, and I'll leave that open to interpretation. And a poet is as much a listener and observer as she is a scribe, a shapeshifter, often forged through a seemingly chaotic nonlinear journey that some would mistaken for fire where others sense a mirror of how we collectively are living poetry. So in the spirit of Floricanto, let our decisions be guided by poetry, a commitment to holding up a mirror to where we are as people and how we can reimagine where we could be as we take action to do what is right for all of us, as opposed to simply reinforcing the select privileges of a few. So we, everyone that I represent in my communities, we call on you respectfully to gather the fullness of who you are and who you carry with you into this work, grounding ourselves toward a collective vision of a more just and equitable world where everyone is seen, valued, and heard in their humanity. Let us take a moment to think about how our ancestors showed up not just in resilience, but in their joy. Let us take a moment to think about how we are showing up for our elders, keeping their dignity intact daily. Let us take a moment to think about how we can do right by our youth. Let us take a moment to think about how we can keep that hopeful, vibrant spirit of every one of our children alive. Let us take a moment to think about how we can do right by all men, women, non-binary and non-gender conforming folks and the unhoused. Let us take a moment to think about our history as the heart of Silicon Valley, the center of the Valley of Hearts Delight. We've always fancied ourselves a region of abundance. And lastly, let us take a moment to ground ourselves in the courage and humility to both listen and act for that beautiful, complicated constellation of people we represent, bridging past and present, serving with humility, integrity, and heart to push for parity, equality, equity, and justice in our everyday governance, aligning our actions with our words. Gracias. Thank you. So let's uh, keep Council Member Carrasco's month going, the month of May, and will, will you join me at the podium to recognize and proclaim May Day? Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to be here all month, folks. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for joining me as I proclaim May 1st, May Day. Celebrated on May 1st, Workers' Day is observed to commemorate both the wins and the losses of workers and the labor movement, memorializing their struggles in the name of workers' rights. 
May Day was first recognized in 1889 by an international federation of socialist groups and trade unions, both in support of workers and in commemoration of the 1886 Haymarket Riot in Chicago. The Haymarket Riot, also known as the Haymarket Massacre, was part of a national campaign working to, sec to secure an eight-hour workday back when a 16-hour workday was normal. The riot resulted in casualties as police intervened to protect strike breakers and intimidate strikers during a union manifestation at the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company. Later, eight men were tried for conspiracy of murder and four of them were hanged, thus becoming international martyrs for the rights of workers everywhere. It's recorded that during his last moment of life, August Spies, one of the convicted men cried out, there will come a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangled today. Then President Grover Cleveland signed legislation to make Labor Day the official US holiday in honor of workers. Now as it stands, May Day serves to advocate for the rights of workers, more pay, better conditions, while Labor Day serves to celebrate the dignity of work. We owe so much to the leaders and the martyrs of the labor movement. A guaranteed minimum wage, an eight hour workday, a 40 hour work week, and time and a half overtime, all thanks for the fight for justice. And as COVID-19 swept through the world, we again found ourselves challenged to ensure the rights of workers everywhere, especially for those essential workers our field laborers, store clerks, doctors, nurses, fight, first responders, responders, teachers, all those who weren't afforded the benefits of working from home. We honor the lives of those lost to COVID-19 and once again reckon with the workers' rights as the discourse for a four-day work week is more prevalent, as conversations about workplace conditions become normal, and as workers understand the value of their service. It's with that sentiment that I present this proclamation to Jean Cohen with the South Bay Labor Council, David Beeney with the Santa Clara and San Benito Counties Building and Construction Trades Council, and Enrique Arguello, oh, I says, with Enrique Arguello and, and Luis, Luis was here also, uh, with Niuna Local 270. Through their collective work, they represent thousands, thousands of hardworking men and women who add to the value of our great city. They're front and center at the battle for wage theft and modern day slavery. And it's through their, their work that we are reminded that without labor, capital is non-existent. In San Jose, we honor the work of these men and women. They literally have built this city, our homes, our roads, our bridges. They educate our children and make our city run. In battles of values, we have to rise above and make sure that families have dignified work and can feed their children, especially here in the Bay Area, where cost of living is so incredibly high. We cannot expect families to live in poverty, and a good union job secures that. They may not be wealthy, but they have a solid quality of life. Their kiddos have access to opportunity. I thank you all for ensuring the well-being of our families. And I ask the mayor, who just joined us. Hi, mayor to present the commendations to our, to our representatives, Jean, David, and Enrique. And, uh, would you like to? Okay. Thank you so much to the city council and uh, council member Carrasco in particular. The labor council represents 100,000 working men and women and 101 unions, but the work we do every day is to advance causes, policies, and environments that protect all working people in San Jose and Santa Clara County. I'd like to just thank the city council and especially the staff of the city who over COVID have really provided essential services, not only to working people who have had jobs and making sure that they are getting paid a fair wage and that their work sites are safe, but also for so many people who struggled over the last 24 months and weren't able to pay their rent, weren't able to feed their kids, needed 
internet to make sure that their children were learning. So just wanna say thank you to everybody who creates the labor movement. The labor movement is working people and we appreciate the partnership with the city of San Jose continue to do the important work that we all do together. Thank you. Mayor, do you mind if I add something about May Day? May Day was also my mother's Labor Day, as that was my birthday. All right, Council Member David Cohen is here. Uh, we will be remembering American, Armenian Genocide uh, Remembrance Day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, today we're here to uh, recognize Armenian uh, Genocide Remembrance Day. Uh, on April 24th, Armenians around the world and here in San Jose commemorated the 107th anniversary of the beginning of the Armenian Genocide. Starting on that day in 1915, a million and a half Armenians living on ancestral Armenian lands in the Ottoman Empire were driven from their homes and systematically murdered in an unprecedented campaign of extermination. For those who survived, life would never be the same. They lost their homes, their families, everything they owned, and were forced to seek refuge on foreign shores where they often continued to face discrimination and prejudice. But Armenian Gen Genocide Rem Remembrance Day is not only a day to mourn all that was lost during the genocide, it's a day to honor the strength and resilience of those who survived, who in the face of unimaginable loss and suffering built new homes and communities around the world. Many of them came to America and settled here in California and particularly in San Jose, and our community is all the greater for their contributions. They have become leaders in government, in education, in arts and sciences, and shown the world that even out of great adversity, there's still hope. The survivors and children have never forgotten the tragedy that brought them to our shores. Today, we affirm their story. We honor their pain, and we renew our commitment to speaking out against these atrocities, no matter where they happen, to build a world untarnished by hatred and prejudice. The most important thing we can do to honor this day is to uplift the voices of those in the Armenian American community to hear their story and their words. So uh, I've invited today uh, Ani Yeni Kamshian, uh, who is the chair of the Silicon Valley chapter of the Armenian National Committee of America, which is a grassroots organization giving a voice to the needs and concerns of Armenian Americans. So first we'll present the the proclamation and then let her say a few words. On behalf of the Armenian American community, I would like to thank the Honorable Mayor, Sam Licardo, Council Member Cohen, and all the San Jose City Council members for declaring April 24th, 2022, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. About the genocide, what happened and why? The Armenian Genocide of 1915 to 1923 was planned and premeditated removal of the indigenous Armenian people living on their ancestral lands for thousands of years. Erasure of their existence, forced Turkification of the remaining few, and confiscation of their assets and properties by the Ottoman Turks. Consequently, it is fair to say that current day Turkey was built on the removal of the Armenian people and taking over all of their assets and properties for which Armenians never saw justice. And how did the US help at the time? 
U.S. Ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Ambassador Henry Morgenthau, reported atrocities as they were happening. Missionaries from the U.S. traveled to help. Humanitarian aid was provided by the Near East Relief, U.S.'s oldest congressionally sanctioned NGO, raising at that time, imagine, over $110 million for refugees and orphans. There were, by 1922, there were over 100,000 children that were living in orphanages. There was one major orphanage, 25,000 kids in just one orphanage alone. We are eternally grateful to all those that helped at that time. Armenians arrived to the U.S. as a direct result of the Armenian Genocide. They were hardworking and quick to adapt to their new home. Since their arrival, they have contributed immensely to the fabric of Santa Clara County, the state of California, and the United States of America, and very proud citizens of the United States of America. What it means for Armenians living here in San Jose, it means opportunity, opportunity for education, work, to live safely, comfortably, to provide for our families. American Armenians are grateful to have the opportunity to live here, and they give back to the communities they live in. Why can't we move on? I was discussing with Allah yesterday, this, this question comes up to us, why not move on? A few reasons. Not only have we been dealing with genocide denial for over 100 years, but more recently in 2020, we witnessed hate crimes here in the San Francisco Bay Area, followed by the unprovoked attack against the Armenian people living in Artsakh by Azerbaijan with the direct assistance of Turkey. Our generation never imagined we would witness the continua continuation of the genocide with ethnic cleansing, war crimes, land confiscation, and erasure. All while hearing comments from the aggressors finishing what their ancestors started. So daily threats and harassments do continue again, uh, today against Armenians with the intent to force more concessions. It makes it difficult to move on. Um, the Armenian people hope and pray for change of heart of the leaders of these two countries, acknowledging of the wrongdoings, and only then there can be long-lasting peace. It's something that we all want. What happens now with the U.S. formally recognizing the Armenian Genocide? Uh, House and Senate passed, uh, passed uh, policy, U.S. policy to commemorate uh, genocide, reject denial, and to educate the, about the Armenian Genocide. And President Biden also formally uh, addressed it in his statement in uh, 2021. What this affirmation does, it combats denial. And with Armenian genocide recognition comes responsibility. So the U.S. policy must reflect this at every level, from a local level to its foreign policy. So on Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day, we stand together against genocide, all forms of hate and intolerance, crimes against humanity, both locally and abroad. And on behalf of the Armenian American community, we thank the city of San Jose for this proclamation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll have a reappearance of our vice mayor to proclaim small National Small Business Week. And I see several community partners. Dennis is here. Come on down. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, today, we recognize National Small Business Week which is celebrated the first week of May each year. We honor the entrepreneurs of our country who have played their part in bringing new ideas to life and for growing our economy through the 31 million small businesses of the United States. By proclaiming National Small Business Week, San Jose affirms its commitment to encouraging our community and our local small business owners as they recover from the pandemic. One of the major lessons that we've learned in the past few years is that small businesses need capital. It is the pulse and lifeline of every business. I am proud of our city and staff on how we've stepped up to assist our small businesses. In the past two years of COVID, 
over 40,000 individual loans and grants were received by businesses here in the city of San Jose. We could not have achieved this without the collective efforts of the banks, our business advice organizations, as well as the city. The total value of those loans exceeded $2.7 billion. I'm going to repeat that, $2.7 billion for San Jose businesses. Soon, we are expecting to add another $500 million to take us closer to $3.3 billion. Citywide recovery is well underway. Sales tax figures are improving, and unemployment has fallen sharply. But not every business has bounced back. In honor of Small Business Week, the city is launching today a new small business grant program to minimize the risk of commercial evictions and support the commercial property market. Both small landlords and tenants have had a tough time. In this new grant program, just over 2.5 million is available and we expect 300 businesses to benefit. This program went live at 1 p.m. today and will close on May 30th. SBDC, also known as Access Enterprises, will be administering this grant for the city, just as they've done for previous grants. I've asked Dennis King, their executive director, to accept the proclamation today. As we all know, Dennis wears many hats. In addition to leading SBDC here in San Jose, he is the executive director of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and vice chair of the San Jose Small Business Advisory Task Force. Thank you, Dennis, for all that you do for small businesses. I'm gonna ask Dennis to come and say a few words. Dennis? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. If I may digress a moment on the passing of Normanetta. 50 years ago, Normanetta was the mayor of this great city. 50 years ago this year, I was the student body president at San Jose State, and I had a meeting with him when City Hall was over on Mission Street, and at a time when politicians were quick to run against students, he wanted to embrace students. He wanted to say, what bridges can we build between the city of San Jose and the student population of San Jose State and beyond? That led to my inviting him to bring the whole city council to the student union at San Jose State, where we had a meeting. And I believe that's the first formal city council meeting at San Jose State. And Norm Anetta, he kept asking me to call him Norm, and I had a hard time doing that. But Norm asked me to pick a priority. What did we want most important to demonstrate the connectedness between the city of San Jose and the spirit of the students? At the time, there were some very dangerous streets that run right through campus. San Carlos Street, 9th Street. And that set the stage for us through the help of Normanetta and City Council to close 9th Street and then sometime later to close those streets to foster a sense of community on campus that still today rings true about the connectedness to the city of San Jose and San Jose State. What I also remember was before he was a, a mayor, before he was a member on City Council, before he was in Congress, before he was the Secretary of Treasury, or excuse me, of Commerce and of Transportation, before all of those things, he was a small business owner. He was a small business owner as an insurance agent, his own agency, in Japantown. And that's where my father knew him, and I was totally amazed that he had this phenomenal memory to remember people that he just met once and re would remember them for years. He was a phenomenal human being and certainly has made San Jose proud to name its international airport after him and in so many ways keep him close to his heart. So thank you. Thank you, City Council. Thank you for having such an inspired leader among us who saw the value of bringing people together. Now, in addition to that, we do celebrate Small Business Week. And thank you, Vice Mayor, for joining us and having a summit meeting today about helping small businesses get access to capital. That's probably the second most important thing that small businesses need. 
what we know from SBDC, what they need most of all is access to customers. And that's what we try to do in a wide variety of ways. Joining me today, Connie Madrigal, Ali Lopez, are my anchors for helping our small business development literally help hundreds, if not thousands of businesses every year in San Jose throughout the county. Uh, we're honored to work with the city of San Jose on this particular grant program. This is our seventh grant program that we've helped since the advent of COVID. By the end of this summer, we will have written under my signature checks to over $10.5 million to small businesses, mostly here in San Jose. And that's quiet. My only disappointment in these programs is I keep hearing political gadflies and criticism to San Jose about helping small businesses, not realizing the millions of dollars that you have dedicated to helping small businesses that are struggling today. And so I acknowledge that, we acknowledge that, we thank you for your leadership, we thank you for, for caring for your small businesses, and we know in many, many ways, it's the small businesses through its restaurants, its nail salons, hair salons, beauty salons, you name it, that's really the essence of San Jose. And so for that, again, I thank you for giving us the tools, the leadership, the capacity to help so many struggling small businesses for the welfare of the whole community. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're now on to orders of the day. Uh, and one on the council, have any changes to the print agenda? I understand, I believe Council Member Peralta, you indicated uh, a desire to adjourn the meeting, is that right? No, not, not today. I, oh, I we'll was- do it in a future week. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that was it. Thank you, forgive me. Thank you very much for that. We'll, we will do so, uh, certainly to honor uh, Mayor and Secretary Norman Nenna. All right, uh, any other changes? Not seeing any indication, so we'll move forward to the closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. All right. We'll go next to the consent calendar. Are there any items the council would like to pull from consent? Not seeing any hands. Let's go to the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, Thanks for your ceremony item today. Uh, happy May to everyone. Um, I guess, you know, there's uh, a couple items about T-Mobile things, uh, feature of cell things, macro cell it's called. Um, just a reminder that there's gonna be uh, quite the possibility of a lot more uh, surveillance and data collection technology within the micro macro cell system. And, uh, just a reminder that when the importance of bridging the digital divide, that uh, it's the open public policies and accountability practices that we share as a full community process. That's the stuff that can bring in uh, a lot of heart to, to this work that you're doing. And, and whenever you see these sort of items appear, if you think of open public policies and accountability that can go with it, that's, that's key to our future. That's, that's thinking, that's really thinking about our future and our, uh, the future of sustainability and community uh, positiveness. So thanks for this item. And to quickly comment, uh, uh, you've moved around the on the agendas that uh, closed session reports are now at the top of the uh, agenda uh, and not a part of the regular agenda items. 
I, I, it's a smooth way to work. I don't think, I think that I need, I, I question that a bit. I, I question that you have to have closed session items and the city manager's report that has to learn to become a part of the public meeting process where the public can offer public comment. Good luck how we can talk about this issue. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there any reconsideration of my colleagues? Are there any other items to pull? If not, we'll entertain a motion. So moved. So, second. Okay. Uh, let's vote on consent. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Picardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, on to item 3.1. Reporter or city manager? No report today, Mayor. Okay, Mr. Chansley. All right, item 3.3, <laughs> actions related to Great Oaks Water Company application for renewal of a potable, potable water franchise. Uh, there's no presentation, is there? Nope, Jeff is shaking his head. All right, do uh, we have any members of the public who would like to speak? I have no hands. All right, let's entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Second. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item 3.4 is the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices appointment. Sign requires two thirds vote. Uh, Tony, would you like to? Sorry, I missed that when I was prepping today. No problem. Hold on. Today we got time. <laughs> Tom is on. Tom Pav um, Pavel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. He is okay. available on Zoom. Okay, great. Hello? Mr. Pavel, are you with us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, did I pronounce your name correctly? Forgive me. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, my, my name is, is Tom Pavel. Pavel, thank you, sir. Thank uh, you, Mr. Pavel. Yeah, hey, thank, um, you, uh, thank you for the opportunity to apply for this position. Well, well thanks for your willingness to, to serve. Um, why don't we give you a couple minutes just to tell us a little bit about uh, why you'd like to serve and why you believe you'd be able to do a good job on this uh, on this commission. And then we'll go to the council for question. Great, great. Um, so I am a, a retiree uh, from uh, 20 years in the uh, tech industry. And before that, my uh, training was actually as a particle physicist at, uh, at Slack at Stanford. Um, last year, I had the privilege to serve on the civil grand jury uh, and I found that to be a very rewarding experience. Um, in particular, uh, I, I, I was attracted to the uh, idea of sort of bringing my expertise and skills, um, which I might, uh, I guess, characterize as focused around uh, statistics and uh, analytics. Um, so bring that to a, a new or different area that could be of service to the community. Um, so uh, I guess after looking around at the San Jose commissions, um, it seemed like the FCPP could be a good fit. Uh, there appear to be several vacancies at present. Um, I have a basic familiarity with uh, campaign finance issues and I have a firm conviction in favor of uh, transparency in campaign finance and in lobbying. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if I'm, you know, actually a perfect candidate for this position, but I am looking for a way to serve the community and I thought, thought this might work. Thank you, sir. Uh, the good news is I don't think we've ever appointed a perfect candidate. So you're, <laughs> you're in the perfect spot. Okay, uh, do we have questions from the council? Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Pavel. Um, my question is, um, 
you potentially, if you're on on this board, could receive uh, complaints and allegations against candidates and elected officials. And in the past, there was a concern that uh, people were using that board to um, for political reasons and not necessarily to report or adjudicate any misdeeds. So I just wanted to get uh, uh, your your take or understanding on how uh, you would evaluate uh, complaints that come uh, before you and and how you would address you know situations where you had to make that kind of judgment call. Um, yeah, so I, as I understand the uh, the investigation or the collection of the facts around the complaints is done by uh, dedicated uh, uh, in investigators. And so the the role of the of the commission of the board, I guess, is to, uh, you know, look at those facts uh, objectively and, and, you know, decide on uh, uh, whether that violates the rules or not. Um, I, you know, don't have any political um, attachments in, in San Jose or, you know, in local politics or anything. Um, uh, and so I certainly wouldn't be using this to uh, uh, try to further any particular uh, uh, parties. Thank you. That was it, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prevell, I appreciate your, uh, your prior service on the civil grand jury. Thank you for that. And I also appreciate your response to that question about List of three issues facing the city. I appreciate you being forthright about the fact that you know this is really a, a commission that addresses complaints that come to it. Um, I, I know there are going to be circumstances, as there often are, uh, for for all of us, where you're going to be asked to apply the rules uh, to a set of facts, and the outcome may not be one that seems to be the right one in your mind. In other words, uh, maybe you think the rules ought to be different. Maybe that this is a unique circumstance where these rules shouldn't apply. But whatever the case might be, you think that the rules you got don't get you to the right answer. How, how do you reconcile that challenge where you believe um, uh, in terms of what your duty is uh, here on this commission. So as I understand the commission uh, has a, has an alternate, uh, you know, one of the missions of the commission is also to recommend changes to the rules to the uh, council. And it seems to me that would be the appropriate way to try to, you know, if you found that the rule was not appropriate in this case, um, it would seem like, you know, you should rule on, on the case with the, uh, as the ruling as the rules currently stand and then you should recommend a change to the rules for future cases I, it seems to me the right approach thank you sir very much appreciate your answer all right other questions or comments okay i think we can then draw it to a close uh with a simple motion would that be appropriate to me so moved second all right Motion from the Vice Mayor and seconded from Councilmember Mayhan to approve uh, this candidate, Mr. Pavel. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, it's a yes for Arenas. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's and unanimous. My staff will contact him to do oath of office and all the other questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Pravel. Look forward to your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. All right, uh, under item 6.1 to revisions to the city of San Jose's water efficient landscape ordinance, affectionately known as WELO. Welcome, Jeff and Carrie. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Jeff Provenzano, Deputy Director, Environmental Services Department, Water Resources Division. 
Uh, you're correct. And uh, today's uh, topic is proposed amendments to our water efficient landscape ordinance. And we will. We may have to wing it. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So this is not our first time. We've been here with a water efficient landscape ordinance or, or Wello as it's, uh, it's called in, in more informal terms. We first came back to council uh, with this um, Wello in 1994. It was amended again in 2013 and 2016. There were several motivations and considerations that we went through and I'll kind of walk through each of those kind of briefly <laughs> um, just to kind of keep it high level for you all. Um, one of the motivations is where we are in our current drought. Uh, we're still in a very severe drought statewide. And unfortunately, we're expecting that to be our future here, uh, periods of extended drought in California. And that was really a motivation for us to, um, in, in looking at how we can adapt going forward to, to periods of drought. And one of those um, is looking at outdoor irrigation, especially here in urban areas like San Jose, outdoor irrigation is at a minimum 50% of the water that we use. Um, upwards of 65%. So uh, not only this action, but other actions in, um, in the future, really to kind of focus on bringing down our outdoor water usage. Another motivation of ours is our climate smart, climate smart, uh, climate smart San Jose goals, of which there are two that kind of align with this policy. One is to reduce specifically residential water usage, and the second is to reduce household energy usage. Some other considerations were benefits to residents and the community. Uh, specifically, we looked at uh, supporting drought resiliency, supporting carbon sequestration, doing what we can to reduce urban heat island effects. And lastly, if there's any ways to generate cost savings or in the form of water savings for residents and customers. Plant selection is one area that we kind of dived into. Uh, understanding that uh, there's a, a broad range of water uses and plant types. Uh, this slide we thought was pretty informative uh, for ourselves and hopefully for council. I want to call your attention to the bottom row of ground cover and shrubs. Ground cover and shrubs, especially native plants or drought tolerant plants, have a very low water usage factor. And if we compare that to the top row, which is turf grass. Uh, turf grass, um, what we're, we know that as here in California is most commonly called Kentucky uh, bluegrass is a type of grass that we have um, almost everywhere. And it has a very high water factor. In fact, it's about 10 times the amount of water to water Kentucky bluegrass than it is ground cover and shrubs. In addition, Kentucky bluegrass is also uh, not native and invasive. We put this table together and kind of looking at what, what could the possible savings be for, for a resident in, in the future. Um, just to kind of get a gauge of how much water is used and, and what, what changes that we could uh, recommend and what the benefit would be. For a typical single family resident that has high water use needs, they're using about 38,000 gallons of water annually to water their front yard. If that front yard were to be converted over time to a low water use plants, that would decrease the amount of water used in the front yard by about 80%. And to go to a very low water plant base, would decrease front yard water usage by about 90%. And you may recall I mentioned just a bit ago, outside water use is about 50 to 65% of all the water that we use here in San Jose. We also spent a lot of time focusing on native plants. Um, the, the resolution, uh, sorry, excuse me, the uh, ordinance uh, recommendations before you uh, do not specifically um, mandate native plants. Uh, but we did spend a lot of time working on it, um, on the benefits of those. And I want to spend just a few minutes going over uh, three benefits. One, native plants, like all drought tolerant plants, have a very low water usage factor, so they use less water. Um, the second, uh, native plants create a biome um, within their root structure. And that biome is really important. And, and biome, I mean uh, microorganisms, bugs, insects. They live and grow within the root structure and surrounding area of these native plants. And that's important because 
that biome is called a healthy soil in other terms. And what that healthy soil does is it helps to retain moisture so that that water evaporates slower over time, and that could help with reducing urban uh, heat island effect. Uh, in addition, because those plants use less water, more water is retained in the soil longer. And secondly, or sorry, and lastly, um, that biome is really healthy. Uh, the ecosystem is really healthy in that it not only entraps carbon, but also helps in pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's called carbon sequestration. So we see multiple benefits in switching to native plants um, and drought tolerant plants in general. I mentioned this just a minute ago. We also looked at urban heat island effect and any possible amendments that could help support a reduction in those. And we found two really in, in finding ways of reducing hardscape in, in a reasonable manner and also to look at different types of plant selection. And lastly, we looked at different types of irrigation. Uh, typically, uh, or historically, spray irrigation has been the way to go for most plants. But as we move into moderate to low use plants, spray irrigation isn't necessarily the most efficient um, for watering or the most efficient in, in reducing water usage. And so we looked at recommendations that we could provide to council on going towards low flow um, irrigation, such as drip irrigation, bubblers, uh, misters. These are all irrigation devices that focus on applying water directly to the root ball of a plant and really add that water supply directly into that ecosystem or biome that I was mentioning earlier. This table in summary is um, the, the main uh, changes to, that we're recommending to our ordinance applicability. And again, we have a wellow. We've had a wellow in place since 1994 in different versions. So one of the main recommendations is to remove that lower threshold for new construction, to remove the threshold of 500 or more square feet, and just say all new construction have to uh, apply to this. We also specific, uh, specifically called out backyards. That was a, a lengthy discussion on, on how, how we might impact backyards. And we wanted to be very clear um, that this is really focused on front yard and new construction. Also, the existing uh, ordinance has three different compliance pathways. Uh, so we, the current way we have it worded now, we do allow high water use plants, which didn't seem to fit with where we are and where we're going to be going in the future. So we kind of revised the compliance pathways and really narrowed it down, um, ideally, too, to really streamline the application process to make sure um, its um, expectations are known for anyone that wants to work here in San Jose or has to, um, uh, has to do a landscape project. Um, and, and applies to the, these applications. So I uh, really got rid of the three pathway compliances and just required um, na uh, moderate to low, uh, low water usage plants for all new construction. And second, we uh, looked at, again, I kind of mentioned the bubbler systems, the sprinkler types, and some limitations on hardscape that we, th we thought went along and we could help us achieve those other objectives. And with that, we did pretty extensive, uh, we, th we believe pretty extensive stakeholder engagement, um, a wide group of individuals. We've got several good comments back. Most comments were around applicability, um, individual circumstances. We did make some minor changes, particularly uh, as one example, Charities Housing reached out to us on if the way uh, our, the wording was any way going to impede their ability to get tax credits for affordable housing. And we, wait, we went back and made sure that the language in the proposed uh, the, the recommended changes to the proposed ordinance um, in no way impedes, um, for example, charities housing and, and their work in, in getting tax credits. So we tried to go back. And uh, most of the other comments were uh, generally supportive um, and, again, mostly around applicability. And with that, I would like to uh, answer any questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Gary. All right, let's go to the public first. Claire Beekman. Hi, Claire Beekman here. Uh, just a, a quick re reminder that, uh, you know, it's a few years old now, but, you know, a few years ago, there was some serious issues about the future of, uh, uh, you know, creating uh, good irrigation plans and, 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 and islands and, 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 you know, flow of how landscape. Yeah. 
Blair, you accidentally muted yourself. Okay, I'm gonna go back to council. Okay, we're back to council. All right, council member Mayhan. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to quickly express my thanks. I, I appreciate the direction we're going in here. I think this um, makes a lot of sense. It's a it's a very targeted, smart, adaptive measure. We're going to have to take more of these as as we move forward. I think, and I appreciate that it's that it's incremental, that it's that it's focused um, in scope, and and still offers flexibility. Right? It's a, it's a framework within which there are still a fair bit of latitude to make decisions. And given that over, what is it, over 50% of our water use in San Jose is still outdoors, this, um, so I see you nodding for those who are watching on TV. Um, this seems especially important. I also think it's worth noting that the best time to get these things right is when we, uh, when we build something new. Because once we've built it, it may be there for years, if not decades. So uh, I think this is a great place to start. I did have one question, which is um, for developers, homeowners, residents who are interested in the research behind this, the plant list, the products we recommend, do we have a hub that helps people jump off to information they might need? Is there an easy place for them to go to learn more? Uh, we do. Yeah, we have our own websites and other websites, uh, for example, of Valley Water, where this information is available, and we can get that to you. Okay. But we do link off to those other places yes, with the do. plant lists and all of that. So there's one one stop shop for people who need to comply with this. Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Just wanted to confirm. Great. Uh, Mayor, with that, I'll move acceptance of the water efficient landscape ordinance. Second. Lots of seconds. Thank you. Councilman, Councilman Davis. Thank you. I just want to give my thanks to you both for, um, to Jeff and Carrie, for you both for listening to our comments and our suggestions and doing additional outreach and making some amendments after the Transportation and Environment Committee meeting. Um, it's very, I've, I think they're, they're good amendments and I think exempting backyards is helpful and as well as play areas, we still need that nice natural grass for our kids to be able to kind of run in place. So I, I appreciate uh, where we've come out on this and I'm happy to support it today, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mira. I just want uh, Carrie and Jeff, if you can just do me a solid and just state again that this is only for new construction because I, I'm afraid that my, if, if it's not clear that my inbox is gonna get blown up with people <laughs> terrified that we're gonna come and pull up their grass. That's correct. And just to clarify too, there, we do have an ordinance in place, and that's modeled off the state ordinance by requirement. Uh, what the proposed recommendations here affect the, that lower threshold for new development, which is reducing uh, that the previous threshold was 500 square feet or more, and we're just saying for new development, uh, any new development. Great, I, I appreciate that. I don't want the mayor to have to go through another council meeting where he has to clarify that we're talking about something very specific. So thank you, that was it, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for saving me that trouble. <laughs> cool, uh, all right, any other, oh, Council Member Foley. Thank you, uh, thank you for the report and uh, for the clarification that it is new construction. But Jeff, something you just said triggered some new construction in my mind. ADUs, ADUs, if they, uh, they're done with permits, well, theoretically, they're done with permits, that would trigger these restrictions to be kicked in for any landscaping in the front of the property, but not necessarily the back of the, the backyard. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. If they if they are redoing, so yes, yeah, so an ADU would, would typically be in the backyard. If they're redoing a landscape in the front yard, then at the same time, then this would kick in. Okay, and does. Uh, do does our ordinance or does this change have any effects on school districts no. or schools? Okay, thank you. Happy to support. Thank you. Um, so I guess Jeff, I was going to ask for some little advice here uh, for those of us who have yards uh, and 
if I'm one of those guys who is industrious enough to tear out the lawn during the last drought, but not industrious enough actually to plant anything else and just, you know, have a bunch of dirt for the last six years. Uh, and neighbors occasionally ask me what I'm going to do, and I, oh, it's coming. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I got a next door neighbor. I'm not going to dime him out specifically because he's a city employee, but he's got some pretty cool cactus all over. And I'm just wondering, those cactus aren't going to give us the same benefits as all the, the local uh, uh, indigenous plants? The research because they we, look pretty cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, you know we recommend actually the way we're, the way we worded it. Um, there is a water use uh, plant standard. There's like 3,500 plants on there, and we're recommending yeah. um, uh, lower water, moderate to lower water use plant, use plant uh, plants. But we don't specifically say native. So if you are looking at um, if you are looking at redoing your front yard, we'd recommend yep. go native. Yeah, understood. I was just trying to I understand that cactus is good, native is better. There you go. And I just wanted to understand uh, whether cactus can ever get you any of those benefits of natives. And it sounds like you're saying no. You might get some benefits, but not much. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask you to explain to my wife why we can't get cactus. Anyway. <laughs> okay, let's vote on the motion. Jimenez? <laughs> yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. And I just want to add that I just recently redid my yard to all California native and it's beautiful. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> item 7.1 this is uh, the city roadmap encampment management and safe relocation policy. And we have Lots of folks here to help. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is John Cicerelli. I'm the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. With me today, Andrea Flores Shelton, our deputy director. Uh, next to her, Olympia Williams, division manager for the encampment management program in Beautify. Next to her, Reagan Henniger, the deputy director in housing. Behind me, we have uh, Jackie Ronald's friend, the director of housing, um, and Nicole Burnham, deputy director, Parks and Rec, and Angel Rios, deputy city manager. We're here today to talk about encampment management and safe relocation. Uh, we have a Fairly quick 15 minute slide presentation we're gonna walk you through sort of about where we've been and where we're going. Um, we are also aware of the, yeah. I think by my count, 21 recommendations we have to review uh, after that. So uh, we're here all afternoon. Thankfully it's a light agenda. So uh, with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Andrea. Thank you. Good afternoon. There we go. So all hands on deck here. Uh, per the city's roadmap priority, PRNS and housing own these four encampment objectives you see in coordination with the Environmental Services Department, Code Enforcement, Public Works, Transportation, and our county partners. Together, PRNS and housing drive aggressively to achieve numerous key results on a quarterly basis. So why encampment management? The principles of an equitable, effective, and efficient strategy presented to you in 2020 still apply today. As you know, this city shifted from an abatement approach to a housing first model, which minimizes re-traumatizing those who are living outside and who are disproportionately people of color. Encampment management acknowledges that there is not enough housing. Therefore, encampment locations do exist and will exist, yet an effective strategy means that they should be clean and offer some force form of sanitation, hygiene, and social services. To this end, this council and administration has made significant investments in Beautify SJ to effectively create a new core city service, the Encampment Trash Program. And by the end of this month, the approximately 200 encampments citywide will transition from every other week pickup service to weekly trash service. <laughs> Also, with the intentional efforts to scale up interagency partnerships and services, by the end of this summer, you should see improvements in cleanliness throughout the city. Here we go. 
um, oh, also, with the proposed budget's addition of physical uh, deterrent funding, we are striving to install gates, boulders, and other types of tools to prevent and limit reencampments in key areas. We will assess its effectiveness in allowing our teams to be more efficient with time and resources. That and I'll keep talking. At the core of our work, we're operationalizing a new, complex, multi-dimensional model of protocols, services, and systems, while attempting to put compassion into action with those most impacted at the center. We work amongst this tension that is present for all of us, how to maintain the quality of life that housed residents have come to expect, while also creating a standard of living for unhoused residents. We're looking forward to developing a more responsive customer service experience where we're able to communicate what we do, when we will do it, and what our decisions are. While not every neighborhood, business, or waterway in San Jose experiences the impacts of encampments the same, we do have every intention of treating our customers the same with timely information. Now I'll turn it over to Olympia to discuss what success looks like. an example of an interagency cleanup. In March 2022, the Beautify, Beautify SJ and Valley Water held an escalated cleanup along the Coyote Creek at Watson Park. An escalated cleanup includes the removal of excessive amounts of trash and debris and right sizes encampments to a 12 by 12 footprint. An escalated cleanup also includes the towing of inoperable and stripped vehicles. More specifically, once the cleanup is completed, encampments will remain at the site with a smaller footprint. Over the last year, the city conducted 179 escalated cleanups. In this case, over a three-day period, the city removed 14 inoperable vehicles and coordinated with Valley Water to remove over 44 tons of trash from the area. Additionally, our volunteers through Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful removed an additional 3.89 tons of trash for a total of not over 96,000 pounds of trash removed for this cleanup. Residents remaining at the site were enrolled in the Cash for Trash program to help properly dispose of trash in the future. Beautify SJ will also continue to monitor the area to maintain cleanliness. While we recognize that this is just one example of a successful escalated cleanup, we do understand that there are many impacted areas along the waterways that can benefit from this type of cleanup. This chart outlines the three-step encampment assessment process that is used by BSJ in coordination with our housing, with the housing department. To better facilitate the encampment complaint intake process, a temporary intake form is being developed that will allow for better tracking and response to encampment complaints. For 22-23, we have proposed funding to support a new data system that can be used by multiple departments to better track and report on activities and services at encampment locations. Moving forward, Beautify SJ will utilize an encampment assessment process when receiving complaints to determine the possible actions. The encampment setback guidelines chart outlines the locations and conditions that can lead to an abatement. These setbacks are enforced areas or locations where living structures and personal belongings are not allowed. There are four categories of setbacks. First, encampments within 150 feet of a school. We really mean built structures or stored items. Currently, this setback does not apply to RVs or other lived-in vehicles. Second, encampments that block the public right-of-way. Third, an encampment that may be posing a health or safety concern. This could include an encampment that poses a fire danger. We coordinate with San Jose Fire Department to address these types of issues. And last, encampments that obstruct critical infrastructure, such as access to a hospital or trauma center, or impact public operations or maintenance. The encampment management team is also in development of an encampment risk factor checklist that will help guide encampment abatement decisions. Beautify SJ works closely with interagency partners to address the impact of trash and debris near our waterways as well. Currently, we focus services along the waterways by addressing trash and debris in the existing direct discharge areas, which are located from Quarry Court to Capital Expressway along the Coyote Creek. To focus on areas most impacted, 
we are recommending that a new biweekly trash service for encampments located in these direct discharge areas begin in July. Moving forward, we will continue to refine the cleanup plan and strategy to address trash along the waterways in coordination with ESD to align with the new regional water board permit. Moving on from the encampment management section to the Guadalupe Gardens update, which we're all familiar is the airport property um, located at Spring Heading in Asbury. And before I turn it over, I'd like to provide a few beautify updates related to Guadalupe Gardens. In the last six weeks, 44 vehicles have been towed from stage three. Each week, between 15 and 20 tons of trash has been removed. And three video cameras and three license plate readers were installed this past Saturday to monitor for stolen vehicles and illegal dumping. Today, we are recommending that Council support a request to the FAA to extend the deadline for the complete removal of residential uses from June 30th to the end of September. The FAA has witnessed our progress and is looking for humane approaches to a nationwide issue. With your support, we can pursue the housing plan that Reagan will lay out. But first, an update from Nicole on Prototype Park. Sure, thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, so when we were here in February, we uh, showed you graphics of a prototype park for that 40 acres, and we mentioned we needed to do additional community feedback. That feedback was completed through both a community meeting that was held via Zoom on April 4th, as well as an online survey. As a result of that feedback from the second round, um, we have advanced the plan uh, of the prototype park, and the key changes are, are listed here, but I'll use, oh, oh sorry, guys. I'll use this graphic to just highlight a few of them. Um, the dog park was relocated to the, um, uh, away from the creek as the request of a community input. Um, we've made the disc golf area smaller. We've advanced um, and provided more area than we had previously provided for future urban agriculture. Uh, we also clarified uh, what's happening along Coleman Avenue. One of the things that we've been working on with our partners at the airport is the idea that while we develop the park space interior to the area, that they would be allowed and we would support their development of per certain properties on Coleman Avenue that are currently mapped as part of the park, that we would support those for commercial development. So we clarified what's happening there on the, on the left side of that graphic. Um, and we also included, we still continue to hear from uh, roller skating community wanting to see uh, more activity and more opportunity uh, for them to have space. So we took the pathway that had been in the initial plan and made it more sinuous at, to wrap around the space. At first it will be gravel, but our hope is that in the longer term with the appropriate CEQA clearances that we can um, perhaps have that be a paved space. Uh, so all of that is progressing. Um, our partners at Public Works are working on the construction documents needed to support the dog park. We are actively coordinating with Silicon Valley Disc Golf. We are also actively coordinating with, uh, with Guadalupe River Park Conservancy about the future urban agriculture use and what that might look like and how they may be able to help us move that forward. Um, there are some critical path items associated with this design that we are still in the process of, of addressing. One is related to soil sampling. We've done phase one site assessment. We are in the process of doing phase two. That soil sampling should be done later this month, but we need to ensure that this area is appropriate for public use. Uh, we continue to need to work on our environmental clearances. While there was environmental clearance for the master plan from 20, uh, I'm sorry, from 2002, we need to make sure we have appropriate clearing clearances for these current uses. And last but not least, um, and perhaps most importantly, we still need to work with our partners at San Jose Airport and the FAA to get clearance to have these activities here without the need to pay for fair market value of those uses. And with that, I will turn it over to Reagan. Good afternoon, Reagan Henninger with the Housing Department. Over the last seven months, we've housed 71 people who are living in the area of Guadalupe Gardens. To us, that is great progress, particularly given the fact 
that there is very little housing options available for people. But to others, it's not so fast, right? Especially to the people who are living outside and suffering every day. We're not moving fast enough. Since our last report to you, we have made progress in securing additional housing resources. This chart lays out the housing plan for 131 people who are still residing in phase three and a stretch of the Guadalupe River Trail from heading south to Taylor. 26 will be housed through our regular coordinated entry system. That is our housing system working every day to house people and we have predicted based on what people's housing needs are and with the availability in the system that 26 people will get housed in the next 30 to 60 days. 24 individuals will be housed in our rapid rehousing program. That's a time limited rental subsidy. 50 will receive housing choice vouchers. That is a new resource that came to us as a result of our request to the housing authority for these vouchers. Those are also rental subsidies that are for private market housing. Four individuals at the site are very high functioning and need minimal intervention. And so what that means to us is that they qualify for our housing problem solving program, which is a one-time financial assistance with case management support. And then finally, there are 27 individuals who either need an updated VI SPDAT, wish to remain, remain anonymous or have not yet completed a VI SPDAT. And we think those individuals will be housed with either a housing choice voucher or through rapid rehousing. But you can see here, we are coordinating quite closely with the county where the city is taking the lead for 34 of those individuals and the county is taking the lead for 76. This work will not be easy, and the details behind this simple chart are very complex. The housing plan relies on the availability of private market housing, both for rapid rehousing and housing choice vouchers, but it also relies on the availability of vacancies that are interim housing so that we can quickly move people into interim housing while they're searching for their unit. And we're assisting 131 people with a wide range of abilities and disabilities. And I can't stress that enough that these are not widgets that you simply plug into a formula and predict that they will be in housing in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Every individual will have an individualized housing plan and each has a unique path forward. I did want to acknowledge and thank the county and the housing authority for stepping forward with additional housing resources. And we, the housing department, can provide regular updates to you all on our housing progress. We appreciate your commitment to allowing us the time to focus on housing solutions for the 131 people in this area. I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea. Thank you, Reagan. <clears throat> I'm going to close it out by saying this encampment management team and all the people that work uh, for Reagan and Vanessa and our partners, our vendors, and all the people that work for Olympia, um, we have several projects to finish, service lines to stand up, and people to serve, and of course, outcomes to measure. And we are uh, know that there's a state of urgency to complete them all. And so with that, we are done and we are open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, Olympia, Reagan, John. Thank you for all the hard work. Uh, all right, Tony, should let's go to the public. I think we have people in person here. Sandy Perry. Hello, this is uh, Sandy Perry from Affordable Housing Network. I'm speaking because the network opposes the roadmap and relocation policy the way it's written. The very idea that relocation is an acceptable response to homelessness is wrong. We do support the extension of uh, the Guadalupe Gardens 
uh, the extension of the time before that they're swept from June to September, but it should be longer. Um, we need more resources to speed up alternatives like various housing programs and especially safe parks for, the re for, for RVs. The housing department makes it clear that the problem is the lack of housing resources, not the lie which is being spread uh, apparently by some council members and some political candidates that people on the streets are so-called service resistant. You can't be service resistant to services that don't even exist. Um, we're also extremely concerned about the proposal for uh, a buffer zone ordinance, which uh, we feel, it, again, without alternatives for people to go to, you cannot restrict uh, people uh, uh, and criminalize uh, people's attempts to survive wherever they can. Thank you. Wrote, um, going back to the people in public, um, Rose Barajas, Lisa Reeve, and Mike Eckerd, just um, come on down, whoever gets to the microphone first, state your name, um, and everybody else just line up behind the first speaker. Again, that's Rose, Lisa, and Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Eckhart. I'm a lead member and I'm here in to support the extension of the Guadalupe Gardens. There is interim housing that is being built at this time that is due to be online by the end of the deadline for the extension. We're hoping to be able to move people from there into the interim housing. And at this time, we're also asking that uh, the council take into consideration asking LEAB to be a part of these conversations to help brainstorm some solutions to these problems that we're having. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Rose Barajas, and I am with my team, Lieb, and we are here to support our request um, on your, the mercy of the extension for the spring area. Um, they're uh, trying to clean it up there, and there's just a lot of... Um, you know things that need to people need help with and they're you know just can't get to everybody at once and i just i hope that they get the extension they really need it there's a lot of people that need help thank you thank you next speaker hi good afternoon council my name is lisa reeve I'm here to speak on uh, behalf of being a member of the Lived Experience Advisory Board. Um, I am standing here to support the extension of the spring and heading um, encampment issues. Um, you know, I hear service resistant, and uh, when you've been on the streets for a long time, you don't trust. People don't trust, and it takes a long time to build that relationship. And I think Home First and the other outreach people are doing an excellent job, but sometimes it takes time to build the relationship with people to be able to encourage them to um, accept what we have to offer. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, we can vote to extend the, uh, the time limit for Guadalupe Gardens and also to maybe have some more discussion on the memorandums and um, different statements, staff statements um, that uh, the Lived Experience Board would be glad to, to be part of. And, um, and we're here to, to help people that are in need to get off the streets. And sometimes it's, it's never, a, it's a sticky issue and, you know, it has a lot of facets and I think we're doing good at building the trust. And I'd like to see Lieb, you know, we're offering to be of any assistance that we can to help people. Sometimes it's, it's better to hear it from people who 
have been there, who have been in the situation. You know, we have members who, if you don't know who Lieb is, we're a board of previously or currently even homeless people who work to change policy and, and have our voices heard. And we'd be more than happy to, to lend a hand to help people to trust out there. But thank you. Thank you. Going back to Zoom, Blair Beekman. Blair? Okay, I'm going to move on to Dr. Jackie Newton. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Jackie Newton, and I've been a doctor in San Jose for uh, seven years. I'm the primary care doctor for many people who are homeless living at Columbus Park, and I've gotten to know people living there really well. Reagan and her team, Home First and the Office of Supportive Housing, are, are doing their best, but whether we like it or not, there's not enough housing or safe parking sites for all of the people who are living there. But people have managed to make Columbus Park their home with the few resources that they do have. Um, people have even built little homes for themselves, and they've created their own communities to protect each other and keep each other safe. Cleaning the city's public space at Columbus Park means cleaning out the people who live there. We are breaking up people's homes, their community, and their families. And I want you to know that many people have chronic medical conditions. For years, I've been going to Columbus Park once a week to treat those medical conditions, keeping them out of the hospital. And in fact, residents at Columbus Park face more health care disparities of homelessness than the residents um, from many other encampments that we serve. When people are swept, it makes my job harder to find them, and often I don't find them. We're only, you know, we're not only breaking up people's homes, but we are also disrupting their medical care and their health. People will get sicker and end up back in our hospitals and costing our system even more. So, you know, please definitely extend the time, you know, if, if we are going to sweep them. But, but honestly, I, I, I plead to you to keep Columbus Park as their home um, by making it a sanctioned encampment. Don't spend money on beautifying the park for people who walk their dogs and play disc golf. You know, spend the, the money on people who actually live there. Give the residents resources to live safer, healthier lives and get them permanent housing. Thank you. Erica Pinto. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council members. My name is Erica Pinto, speaking on behalf of SPUR. We appreciate city staff's cross-departmental and cross-agency coordination to thoughtfully develop and implement encampment management strategies that address the looming FAA deadline for the flight path across Guadalupe River Gardens, and then center priorities to do this equitably, safely, and with a housing-first model. We would also like to thank the public engagement work done by PRNS and the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy to update plans for the prototype park after receiving additional community input. Further, we are also in support of staff's recommendation regarding the update and deadline extension of the Guadalupe Gardens cleanup to the end of September 2022. We recognize that ongoing and consistent funds for cleaning, oversight, upkeep, and public space activation are just as important in our parks. Operations and maintenance include repairs, landscaping, cleaning, and waste management that are critical to the success of a public space. SPUR will continue to engage with the city and county to address these needs for the long-term long success and well-being of residents. Furthermore, the underlying forces that cause homelessness are deeply rooted in housing, economic, and racial inequity. While homelessness is a current condition that park managers and stewards must, must work with, the city, county, and state must continue addressing the housing shortage, income inequality, and other structural causes of homelessness. We are hopeful that this collaboration will lead to continued implementation of strategies that are rooted in an equitable approach that addresses the current need and believe the call for a month by month work plan is appropriate given the complexity of the situation. We look forward to hearing discussion by the city council that considers strategies that address this ongoing need to rapidly rehouse unhoused residents and that will provide for long term solutions and city staffing needs to sustain vibrant and clean parks in San Jose. Joanna Zing. 
Hello, my name is Joanna Shing and I'm a San Jose resident and staff attorney with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, which is a nonprofit legal services organization that advocates for the rights of historically marginalized individuals in Santa Clara County, including unhoused communities. We uh, at the Law Foundation are urging against the adoption of the city's encampment management plan as written. The city's plan fails to provide solutions that actually meet the basic needs of unhoused people and instead creates alarming new opportunities for the city to sweep, displace, and hurt vulnerable unhoused communities. In particular, the city's setback policy for encampments is essentially a buffer zone ordinance. Not only does this raise potential constitutional violations, but it would also subject unhoused people to increased police harassment, criminalization, and exacerbate ongoing health equity crises. Unhoused individuals deserve safety, dignity, autonomy, and most of all, safe shelter, all of which are lacking in the city's roadmap. We urge the city to reinvest resources into affordable housing alternatives instead of further destabilization and criminalization. Thank you so much. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Claire Beekman here. Uh, is this the item that's been uh, kind of deferred over the past few months? Because, I mean, when I first saw this deferment, I thought it was about the idea of how to, we can better consider the future of, of uh, the government encampment process, uh, whether it's government encampments or encampments sponsored by NGOs. Uh, you know, it was just my feeling that uh, we are headed to some important, important work, and I can see parts of that important work within this item. Uh, and yet, from what the previous speakers have said, uh, this is an item that's that's kind of meant as a bit restrictive, and it's kind of the worst parts of ourselves coming out again. Um, I, I'm a bit surprised that you have to have AOPR technology at Columbus Park. Uh, you know, you treat kind of AOPR technology like candy, like anybody can have it. Uh, your best friend's neighbor can walk around the streets with it. It's, it's a fun toy. It shouldn't be treated that way. I, I, I don't think it's necessary. I, there's, a, there's a good feeling, enough of a good feeling at Columbus Park that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have to be doing those sort of things. We really have to consider our, our technology practices and what could be responsibility and minimal practices. Um, with the tow issues uh, around the park area that was mentioned today, I, I really hope that uh, you know, we're headed towards a future that, that people can get help with tow issues from, from city government. They, they can be of service to, to help people get out of that area to where they need to go. Uh, there was a debate last night uh, between uh, the DAs uh, running for Santa Clara County DA. An interesting item was brought up about how, how to bring what I felt, what I got out of it was the idea of how to bring uh, an enthusiasm to invite people to their own feature of, of do they seek drug help or not. That's the sort of direction we should be considering our issues. And uh, that's the Mexican. Marguerite Lee. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you for, um, for this conversation, this very complex conversation. Um, I am with the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. I'm on their board. And I just want to make a couple of comments that the Conservancy supports staff's recommendation and memos regarding an ongoing work plan, added housing resources, including Columbus Park as part of the gardens plan and aligning construction of prototype park with cleanup deadlines. A couple of questions. Um, since the land between Coleman and Taylor were also purchased with federal funds, will do you think the airport will be in compliance if encampments are also present there? And secondly, how will housing efforts and services reach the entire area of the gardens procured through this federal funding. There's just a couple of things on my mind. Uh, we understand all agencies are working to beat the clock, so to speak, and we are very hopeful that collectively as a community, we can have an equitable solution for all our unhoused residents. Thanks so much. Alex Shore. Yeah, definitely a tough issue. This is Alex here speaking personally today. I just want to build on some comments I made the last time we talked about this. I, I do, in fact, think sanctioned encampments, as Councilmember Perales has talked about, is a good way forward for San Jose and would like to see the council and staff continue to work on sites for sanctioned encampments. I also want to balance that with the concern about 
the safety along the trails and the challenges I talked about last month with cars along those trails and potentially uh, impacting pedestrians and bikers and commuters along the trail. That is a big concern for me. Um, I also think we need to figure out how to make our homeless encampments, if they are sanctioned, as safe as possible for everyone, the folks who are unhoused, as well as the folks living nearby. I know that there are a lot of concerns about that. So I hope we can continue to keep these things in the balance while we're working on building up this space and this park. I absolutely think we need sanction, a, at least one sanctioned encampment in our city where the unhoused can go and we can provide them services. And I really, really appreciated the doctor's comments earlier talking about how moving them frequently causes it to be even harder for her to be able to provide services. And that's another reason why I think sanctioned encampments are a good move for the city. So I hope we'll continue to consider that going forward. Thanks. Tarhada Brajal. Good afternoon, members of our city council. My name is Tarhata. I am a nurse who serves the homeless and most importantly, a mother of a four-year-old and a nine-month-old. I proudly live in and work for residents in Santa Clara County. I was part of an expansion of our street medicine team providing healthcare to the unhoused and their very own encampments, Columbus Park being one of the major ones. Quickly, I became aware of the detrimental sweeps um, that are not only for our unhoused, but how detrimental it was for our housed neighbors. These abatements create a never ending revolving door of disease such as syphilis and hep C and exhaustion of our healthcare resources. When we can no longer reach our patients needing treatment due to these sweeps, we cannot provide mental health treatment, STI and hep C treatment, and longitudinal care of our chronic illnesses such as uncontrolled diabetes and heart disease. This only makes it worse for your unhoused residents and for us healthcare employees. Having an escalated abatement simply spreads homelessness to other parts of the city and depletes healthcare resources. During the pandemic, I witnessed families of encampments spreading awareness of COVID, encampment leaders advocating for working wash stations, and many flagging us down, asking us to take care of someone who had symptoms. I am proud that we are one of the safest major cities in the nation when it comes to COVID, but I am more proud of our homeless neighbors not only surviving on the worst elements during COVID, but ensuring they are safe to keep our community safe. When I take my kids to Rotary Park, we pass by Columbus Park, and I take the opportunity to teach my kids to be selfless and fearless leaders. To understand that homeless are people just like you and me, but have had it really rough from people who they are supposed to trust. Ethically, in your heart of hearts, do you think this escalated abatement is right? I'll leave you with this question to ponder. I hope you think about your kids, my kids, and the growing youth looking at you as an example. Scott Largent. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Largent. I am a, a resident of Columbus Park out there. I live in a uh, Chieftain Winnebago um, motorhome. I'm parked directly across from the storage center that's there on heading. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, a lot of things got cut off, resources, stuff I was used to using in my sobriety, um, anywhere from like, you know, the light rail to the libraries. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan on ending up homeless again. I, I, I didn't plan on ending up there. Um, I searched around on Craigslist. I found this RV. I just figured I had to ride things out. I didn't know much about COVID. Um, I couldn't go to my meetings that I went to. They were all cut off. The library was a was a huge resource for me in my sobriety that was cut off. Um, it just all was cut off. And um, I've met a lot of people, I, I, the good, bad, and the ugly out there um, that had a lot of these things in their life happen to them. Um, and, and they've been without services. They've been without therapy, counseling, um, even Judge Manley's courtroom. They went remote and most people were not even able to check up um, with their mental health programs. And these people have now been shoved into one area and it's just some big, big mop bucket. Uh, you'll have people like myself that are six years sober and you'll have people that are half naked running around in circles 
don't even know what planet they're on. Uh, you know, we're on the world stage right now watching this play out. And, and I, I just wish it would the humane route. I, I cannot believe this is happening in Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm very worried about people out there. I've started to care about a lot of people out there and, and they have really no options. And uh, 76 people being housed is Gail Osmer. Um, Becky Moskowitz. Thank you. Uh, Becky Moskowitz, I'm with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. And in addition to um, reiterating my colleague Joanna's excellent comments and those contained in our letter, I wanted to share um, some of what I've learned from doing outreach to uh, folks living in the encampments um, and want to stress my extreme concern about on um, holding ongoing sweeps. Um, while we know that the efforts to rehouse people at the Spring and Heading site are still ongoing um, and that there are not sufficient beds or alternate places for them to relocate to in the present moment. Um, and at the same time, sweeps continue on throughout other parts of the community, um, which will only um, force individuals into unsafe locations and potentially criminalize them um, for our community's lack of affordable housing. Um, so when I talked with uh, individuals living in encampments about sanctioned encampments, uh, the last time that that proposal was on the table, uh, what I learned is that many of the people living in encampments are victims of pretty significant trauma, um, and that in the camps that they've formed, they've formed um, neighborhoods, communities, and in some cases, informal families. Um, and these are the folks that they trust and feel comfortable with. And should they be asked to relocate to a new um, area, they are very fearful of unknown and unvetted people. Um, and therefore, we ask that if any consideration of sanctioned campments be made, it be made of the existing camps and folks not be swept. Thank you. Gail Osmer. Gail, you're still showing as muted. Okay, we're going back to council. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the community who came to speak, uh, and particularly the members of the Lived Experience Advisory Board. I appreciate your offer of uh, engagement and uh, further engagement uh, and advice. I know that I found it beneficial in the past when we work with members of Leave. I believe you guys are affiliated with Destination Home. Is that right? Okay. Same. Yeah. Same group. Wonderful. Uh, Understood. Yeah, you're speaking for yourselves. Um, yeah, we found it certainly helpful as we were um, engaging with members of the Lived Experience Advisory Board around the design of, of um, a quick build community over near Lot E. And so appreciate your willingness to roll up your sleeves with us. Um, I think as John pointed out, we've got a lot of recommendations and staff has more recommendations than they do have money or people. So um, what I want to suggest is each of us talk that uh, if you're about to make a motion that will include or refer to any of your proposed recommendations, that we stop the action, allow staff to be able to respond because I haven't even read all these recommendations yet. Several came in today, I think, or yesterday. Uh, and I think all of us would benefit from being able to take a breath, look at what these specifics are and allowing staff to have a chance to tell us uh, give us their feedback on whatever that recommendation might be. Um, so uh, if you would do uh, the public and, and each other the service, that would be great just to, to, to identify what it is you, you want to specifically refer to and then allow staff a chance to respond and then we'll move forward. Okay, uh, let's go.
to the council. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank the public for all the comments today, especially from the lived experience advisory board. Thank you for coming here and sharing with us. And I want to also thank my colleagues for their thoughtful memos. I know this is something that's important to all of us. And, and I know that everyone has spent a lot of time uh, thinking about how to best address uh, this issue in our community. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank all the staff, not only in the box, but the support staff who are doing all of the work, not just on this 24 page memo and having to sit here through all of all of our questions and comments today, but those of you and your team who are out in the field every day. I know um, I've been out there with you and I know that you sometimes get frustrated about the tasks before you and the restrictions that we all have in time and money and other decisions that have been made that are out of our control. And I really appreciate you trying to thread those needles every day. And I want you to know that you are not alone in that frustration. Um, the public outcry about our homelessness problem in our city continues to grow. And I appreciate that we should see cleaner encampments by this summer. And I know that you know that that will not be sufficient for most of our residents and it it definitely will not be sufficient for me in particular. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Guadalupe Gardens and Columbus Park as they are now in my district. Um, and I appreciate the, the statistics, statistics that you gave us about what has been um, removed from that area as part of phase three already and how many people uh, have been housed so far I did want to ask um, something I didn't hear, and forgive me if I've missed it. How many people um, in the in the 131? Are you including people who are currently living in their vehicles or their RVs? And what is the plan for those people if they're not included in the 131? We are including people who are living in their vehicles or RVs. The plan for them, first priority is housing. Um, all of the, the plan that I showed you that table is all housing options. That is our end goal. If for some reason housing is not immediately available um, or there just could be a situation where perhaps safe parking is an option for some period of time for a household. Um, we are working with Amigos and with the county for their safe parking options. And then we do hope to have a city funded safe parking option online later this fall. Thank you. And do you have a sense, um, because I've been out there and we've had conversations about this, do you have a sense of how many of the 131 um, households, I think it is, it's not individuals, am I correct about that? Um, we say individuals. Okay, the 131 uh, individuals who are, because they live in an RV or because they live in their car, maybe resistant to, be, to entering housing or otherwise service resistant for other reasons? And I think our lived experience advisory board talked about that, that there is, there are trust issues and there are people who are service resistant. Do we have a sense of what, what the core group of people are who are gonna be our toughest challenges? How many there are? Yeah, in our experience in heading and spring, people are receptive to a meaningful offer of housing. So not shelter, not necessarily safe parking, but people want a home. I don't think that's surprising. Um, that's what we found in our work holistically as a system. People want a home. If there is a number of who is service resistant, um, I'll begrudgingly use that term. Um, it would be encompassed in that number of 27 who we don't have a current CIS for. 
Okay, so the 27 is in addition to the 131? No, no, it's inclusive it's of the inclusive. 131. Okay. Thank and, you. And let me just jump in. This is Jackie Morales Fran. I'm the director of the housing department. And as Reagan has said, uh, when people are offered a housing choice, they're much more likely to, to take it. And just based on statistics alone, we could predict that at least 80% of the 27 would accept a housing solution. So there could be a limited number of people that might have additional concerns or challenges on wanting to move. Okay. And are we still able to be servicing cars? So you, you talked about the cars that have been towed. Are we still servicing cars and how many cars are being worked on right now? We are servicing cars. Um, I don't know the number of what's being worked on today. But I do know that the challenge that we have found is that we, people often have to demonstrate that they own their vehicle for the repairs. And a lot of times if you're living outside, you may not have all of that documentation and paperwork to demonstrate that you own that vehicle. The other challenge to the repairs, we have just found it's hard to do the work out in the field in those challenging conditions it's much easier for the mechanic to do their work in the shop right where they have their tools and they can lift the car up and um, so the on-site work has been challenging and it's possible to do simpler work like sure you can replace a battery out in the field but more comprehensive work really um, is preferable by the mechanic to do it in so are you including in the number of 44 vehicles towed, those that have been towed to a shop that has, that we're helping to provide the service or no? No, those are inoperable, unrepairables or unclaimed vehicles. Okay, so what do we do with the vehicles that we're not able to get service that are gonna be inoperable by the end of phase three that we haven't gotten a mechanic out? Yeah, we can work with that individual just say for example we're working with an individual and they're gonna they're enrolled in rapid rehousing and they find their unit and their but their car is inoperable we can work with that individual to either <laughs> tow the vehicle to where they're living or get it towed to the mechanic okay can you talk a little bit about how your data is currently compiled so that housing and beautify sj and the county all have access to the same current information and this kind of goes to council member cohen's memo from from yesterday which is the only one by the way that i didn't incorporate into my memo because we there was overlap in our um putting putting our memos in uh, thank you council member davis um currently beautify sj continues to use the survey one two three system that's to track our trash pickup uh, locations and frequencies. Um, the housing department has their Salesforce database. Um, and then the county has the confidential HMIS um, housing management information system. Um, at this time, we are developing um, a workflow between housing and PRNS. And we are very excited that the proposed budget um, will include $150,000 um, to create a integrated workflow system um, between the two of the two departments so that we do have activities that are related to encampments rather than department um, specific activities. And will those be able to be accessible to us when we get questions from residents so we don't have to bother staff members, we can just look it up? and find out what was what happened most recently at an encampment? So in working with ITD, we have not yet developed and completed the design. And so um, in speaking with many of the council members last week, we heard about this. Um, we understand this is as much about intake, um, our customer service that we can respond to complainants. Um, but if it also is a tracking mechanism, we can look into that. So again, the design is not yet complete. Okay. 
And of the 131 people, and I see I'm almost out of time and I have so many more questions, so I'm gonna ask one more and then I'll come back around. Um, of the 131 people who are still out there, are the, are how are you prioritizing people for housing? Are we prioritizing people who need medications and have disabilities? As we heard from a, a medical professional who serves residents out there, how is that being handled? Yes, I mean, that's generally how our coordinated entry system works, is prioritizing those who are most vulnerable and have the greatest disability. Jackie? Yes, yeah, so, so you want to say um, something? Yes, yeah, so um, the plan does contemplate that the county is going to take the lead on a certain number of the people. So they're, they've already started deploying their outreach, working with our staff and our outreach to identify the people that are in their queue. So they're beginning that work. And then we're taking on the people who need the rapid rehousing through our contracts. Um, and we've begun having those discussions and connecting those people. And then I think there were four or three who had, you know, or higher um, functioning people who didn't who need limited service. And, and we've started working with them as well because it does require this planning. And so they're really being put into the different housing buckets and people are taking the lead and we're, we've started that work to identify uh, people and then get their documents in order because as you can imagine, with many of the people who are gonna be going into private market rate housing, um, you're gonna need documentation, you're gonna need access to past histories in order to make the case and to locate landlords who are willing and able to rent to them. Thank you. I will, uh, since my time is up, I will yield to my colleagues and uh, hope to come back around on the rotation. Thank you. We will come back to you. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, there's a lot uh, to, to, I think, chew on here. And certainly, as you mentioned, a lot of memos. But uh, first off, I want to say thank you to, to staff and thank you for the, the briefing discussion on this. Um, I know there's a, a lot of work and I do agree with the direction, the overall shift in our direction on how we intend to manage uh, encampments and uh, hopefully uh, put people on the best path to be able to get the services, resources, and, and ultimately housing uh, that they'll need, um, albeit a, a, a big challenge and easier said than, than done. The first um, component, and I do, I, there's two memos actually, one that I co-signed on to um, and then one that I that I issued uh, in, independently and so I'll, I'll initially speak to the one that um, that I issued independently. And just in the, the, the first request, uh, and happy to hear back from staff, but in regards to the, the mental health component and, uh, in, and just ensuring better co coordination there um, and incorporating that in all the outreach that we're doing, I think we have some more opportunities today than we have over the years because of some of the, um, the advancements with the county and new investments from both us as well at the city and then I think some of the shift as well that we're hearing from the state level, not necessarily a tool yet, but um, I think that there's some more opportunities there to have a focus and ensure coordination on mental health uh, in that component as we're going out and doing our outreach. And so um, the ask is, uh, in, in my mind, not necessarily significant, um, being able to, to get an update on uh, those efforts. And so, but wanted to hear back from, from staff on that um, recommendation one from my solo memo. We're, um, we're fine with that recommendation. We can certainly include um, a report in our annual homeless report that comes to NFC and to city council, and we would do that report um, in partnership with the city administration because uh, we are working with the city manager's office on that safety net system coordination with the county that includes behavioral health, but other safety nets like reentry and Okay, great, thank you. And then and the second- Paragraph sorry, one, right? That was paragraph one, okay. yeah, 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 the first recommendation, yeah. Um, and in regards to this, the second recommendation, I, I've had conversations with Mary Lee Jennings, the executive director of the Children's Discovery Museum, um, and as um, really excitingly that they've been able to, to get 
uh, back open and people coming in uh, to the Discovery Museum, uh, they have now been dealing with some significant safety challenges there on site and, and a lot of feedback from parents and families, um, namely that actually the access to the, to the building itself where the parking lot is that is immediately adjacent to one of the largest source sites. Um, and then the Children's Discovery Museum itself as well kind of surrounded um, by, by three different source sites, one being the most immediate one there uh, across from the parking lot. And, um, and in the conversations with her and, and trying to consider the, the focus that we have had on some of these, um, the, the, both the setback guidelines and then the prioritization of where we will actually focus on um, some of our abatement efforts, uh, specifically as we, we rolled that out um, initially last year for a focus around schools. Uh, I have an interest to see if we can include that um, as a as a location, a, a priority location as well, and wanted to be able to to hear back from staff on on that. I understand the the um, you know the, the challenges there and, and, and sort of how we're beginning to look at some of these sites. I think the biggest challenge for this particular site is is honestly just the sheer size of the source site that's nearby, and uh, and then the, the significant number of um, individuals that are homeless living in the area, and and just in general the the um, I think being surrounded by a couple of source sites. So, but wanted to hear from staff on that. Thank you, council member. Um, so in looking at uh, the surrounding area around the Children's Discovery Museum and staff, we did meet with um, the executive director of Children's Discovery Museum as well. Um, first off, we did do an assessment and currently um, the source site is outside of the 150 foot school buffer zone that could, um, that you're seeking to apply to the Children's Discovery Museum. Um, and the active encampments that were along the east side of the Children's Discovery Museum in the river, um, staff were just out there yesterday. Um, they're no longer active, they're abandoned um, or just not um, housed at this time. Um, but we understand that um, this facility has had impacts, frankly, for years and decades, given its, its location. Um, and in speaking with Mary Lee and hearing from you as well, we really do think an overall security strategy would be better for um, the building, um, in addition to um, us being fine with adding it to um, the setback guidelines. Um, I just will say the caveat would be once we add one facility, right, um, the anticipation that more would come um, could be a challenge to us, um, but we understand the youth serving um, aspect of it. And um, again, the our team's assessment, and um, John and I were out there with Captain Acosta recently, um, it has frankly gotten smaller. <laughs> the encampment, um, especially towards the end of the parking lot, has gotten smaller um, as people have moved on. Um, and so we continue to manage it, um, understand the situation around it. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and I recognize that challenge. I know we had that conversation and um, and likely we'll, you know, we'll be able to converse about that here, right? I don't think there's a perfect solution, albeit, I do think there's another solution, so I'll, I'll end on those comments. I, I don't know where my timer clock is. Oh, there it is. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but no surprise, obviously, and as I put in the memo, I do think that this is just more reason why, and, and almost in the disclaimer that I had last year, and as we're looking at abating this major area under the, the airport um, uh, right away there, um, that without having an alternative location, sanctioned location for redirecting people to, uh, we continue to sort of just go into this, this vicious cycle. And really where I think the, the biggest challenge for me is that I agree with, again, the direction we're going, I agree with what we're doing at source sites. What, the one piece that I don't agree with is that you know, we have removed ourselves from the selection process of a location, which was very, very challenging when we did um, the you know, emergency interim housing or tiny homes, right? But albeit challenging, I think it's a step that we need to do because what we've done is we've eliminated that and we've said, well, we're going to just bring the source site, the services to our unhoused population wherever they have decided to congregate. And those locations of, of where they've congregated may not be the best locations for us to, to well, number one, offer service. A lot of them are, are not very easily accessible. Number two, they could have a ton of detriment to the surrounding community. In this case, right, Children's Discovery Museum, waterway, you name it. Uh, I would like to, to, to do the difficult first step of identifying the locations. 
Uh, and I think that the, the best route to go down that, um, as I've proposed a couple times now, is the sanctioned encampment route. And so we, we have that opportunity to discuss that in the budget through the MBA process. But I just wanted to highlight again, this is why I think that is so necessary, so that we can actually identify those locations and uh, not end up in sort of the, the, the circumstances that we find ourselves today through source sites. Um, I, I think that it was a, a good strategy to manage and navigate through the pandemic. But as we begin to exit that and what you are proposing here is sort of what is the, what is the go forward um, management look like? I think that we still have disadvantaged ourselves and our community by not identifying what are the, the, the best locations and instead just saying we will react to the locations that have you know, uh, presented themselves and then do our best to manage around those. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the best approach. I think that puts us in the, the, the situation we're in today. Uh, so I look forward to that conversation when that comes up through the, the budget process and I hope my colleagues will be able to support it. I know we supported exploring that last year and we got to the, uh, I know staff did some tremendous work, went out especially, I think the best work that you were able to do was engage with our, our homeless population and got almost unanimous feedback from them that they would absolutely love to know that we had a sanctioned encampment area and, uh, and that they would right, welcome that when being abated or redirected. Um, and, uh, and I would like to be able to, to go down that path. We had the path of what it was gonna cost, what it would take as far as staff wise to simply pilot that opportunity. And so um, I'm hoping my colleagues take the efforts we're doing today, the challenges we're facing and are able to support that as that comes forward through the MBA process. Um, I, I was going to try to maybe make a motion, but there is quite a bit um, here. Uh, and then considering the mayor's request, uh, what, I'll, what I'll do, uh, I'll, I'll wait then until my colleagues speak up, and hopefully we can clear up some of the different requests from, from my colleagues' memos, and we'll make a motion after. Thanks. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, all right, Council Member Cohen. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a, so many questions here. I, I think I'm going to leave some of them to colleagues, and I know others have already started asking some of these questions, although I'm just to first follow up on a few things like, for example, uh, the, this question of Children's Discovery Museum. I mean, it makes sense, except that we obviously all have sites that we could make the same argument about. And so what concerns me is how do we, you know, how, where does that, where do we draw that line, right? I mean, we have people in right across the neighborhood where there's kids living on the street and there's families saying my kids can't go out for out in our front yard. Um, there are obviously, you know, obviously we've dealt with schools, but we have people in parking lots of community centers or the right next door to parks. And so, you know, clearly, I, I think almost every site where we have people now is close to something that you can make the case uh, that, you know, in order for for safety and 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 the comfort of people using the facilities, we would have to do something about it. So. I just, I just get concerned as we begin to single out specific sites rather than think about the circumstances as we, you know, the specific circumstances of who's there and how disruptive they're being um, versus some blanket statement. That's, so I, I don't know if I have the right answer to that. Again, to me, the, the, until we have a place, until we have a place to locate people, it's, it's not necessarily productive to say let's add more sites to our, to our abatements because that all that does is cause other sites to grow because people need to go somewhere when they move from the, those sites. And so, um, and, and, and while I, I agree with Councilmember Prowlis about the need for some sanctioned locations, you know, sanctioned locations that hold a couple hundred people are still not going to, uh, you know, get thousands of people place to go. So, there, so there, this is a really difficult um, problem. I don't know if you want to make a comment about that. Or not. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear that in the case of um, the Children's Discovery Museum, what we're seeing is there wouldn't be a large service impact or there wouldn't be an impact on encampment, frankly, if it did apply to the 150-foot school buffer zone. Um, but to your point, the school buffer zone's intent was around creating spaces where um, young children or, you know, older young teens, right, if they walk to school by themselves without parent supervision, that there wouldn't be encampment um, hindering that. Right. So in the case of Children's Discovery Museum, we understand that parents, for the most part, or teachers are supervising them, right? So again, the intent is a little different um, with the school buffers. Yeah, and people know that, that I've spent a lot of time at schools, um, but I was slightly concerned even by the school buffer zone argument because the 150 feet to me doesn't necessarily guarantee that 
the person that, that the place where people will end up moving isn't going to be in the path by which a student would walk alone to school. So, I mean, the fact is, the fact is that if it's across the street from the student's house, um, even though that might be a thousand feet away from a school, that could be just as, um, or at least a situation just as uncomfortable for the students and their families as if they're near the school. So I, I've been concerned even about the school buffer zone in terms of being a little bit more, um, have a little more discretion about whether the certain locations near schools are actually impeding this, where students are walking versus being in hidden spaces and other places, right? I mean, there, there's so many variables, I think, in all these sites that we should be considering. And I, I do want to point out again, um, we want to differentiate between encampments and specific behaviors of people, right? right? And so many times there can be um, behaviors we don't want <laughs> that are unrelated to encampments. Right, and, and I, and I make sure to tell that, right, I make sure to say that to residents. Mm -hmm. If there's something specifically that's causing a danger or some behavior that's an issue, we have to deal with that immediately. That's a different situation than an encampment. Um, the only thing else I would add on the housing perspective to this whole piece is that the more you say where you don't want people, the more you're going to be pushing people into areas with unintended consequences, right. I think, or us not really realizing where people will go. And this challenge of, you know, whether we open more uh, facilities, whether it's a sanctioned encampment, we opened more uh, shelter space during COVID-19 than in any time in the 15 years I've been here, in a concentrated amount of time. And frankly, the reaction has been, there's more homeless people, but there are more homeless people in shelters now than we had outdoors. So I'm not, I'm, I'm somewhat confused on how there's a belief that if we opened two sanctioned encampments that we would have a very challenging time siting. Because even our, you know, I think the modular housing has been very successful. It looks good. It's extremely quiet. It's functioning really well. We still have challenges citing people that. And to it. have people who are living outdoors in the ways that everyone has all these fears about, like that's even going to be more challenging. So I'm not sure if that solved the, the issue that we're trying to get to because we can't get to scale. Yeah, and I fully understand. I mean, the problem is that n not a single one of the solutions gets to scale, right? I mean, so to me, it's, it's, it's got to be a combination of all of the above. But I agree with you on the idea that creating more places where people can't be actually makes the problem worse in my mind. And that's why, I mean, I tell people, yeah, I could move, we could try to work to move people out of this area, but they're going to move down the street. They could end up even closer to you, or they could end up, they're going to end up being somebody else's issue. So it, it's not necessarily the right thing to do until we have a solution for everybody. But, you know, I'm not sure everybody's patient enough to wait for a solution for everybody. And that's where we run into the challenge, I, I understand. Um, question I have about encampments as well as structures that we see at encampments. We're starting to see people, you know, building um, you know, multi multi-story, very elaborate homes along the creeks near other people's houses. Um, and I fully, you know, understand why people want that kind of uh, space for themselves. But what what is what is our policy about that kind of structure? So, um, especially after the two years, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm, I'm oh, going to talk. No, that's okay. So, you know, um, <laughs> We are, we are seeing the significant um, structures being built, especially kind of near our watersheds. Um, and so that is a part of the work we've been doing with escalated cleanups, which is um, usually those footprints go beyond the 12 by 12 that ideally um, we, we would like to keep people to. Um, so right now um, what we're doing is that's through our escalated cleanup process. When we go through an assessment, we look to see is it conforming to the 12 by 12? If not, then we would go in and do some sort of um, downsizing or right sizing, but allowing folks to stay there. Um, if again, it meets the setback guidelines, it's in a um, deemed an allowable place, and then we seek cooperation from them through trash programs and or continue to stay in the right size. You know, challenging, but this is a part of our ongoing engagement work. And I appreciate the work that you're doing in a lot of these locations. And 
And one of the things you mentioned earlier was putting up barricades so people can't drive into places, for example. I had a quick question about how well that's working. I mean, I know that there's been issues of people cutting locks and being able to still get through. Do we have solutions now that we think are better, um, or are they still um, not working? We're open to all ideas, um, and a new one that we're talking to Valley Water about is um, a lock shroud um, that they have shared with us, and I know um, uh, PRNS is going to be looking into that. Um, but a part of our deterrent work for next year will be understanding effectiveness. You know, we're we're again trying to um, try anything. Like even at Watson Park, we came in with we didn't have a deterrent um, in mind, and it was just such a long space that the team was. Um, clever enough to put in a natural deterrent to see if it could just stop cars from just rolling straight through. So um, we definitely need to know what is effective, um, and it has been challenging, as we know, in, um, yeah. along Mercado and yeah, the, Court. along the creek there. Okay. Um, for the rest of my time, I just wanted to address my memo, which is about the um, building an application that the city would use. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the question. You know, I appreciate the conversation we had last week, Andrea and Reagan, about this, and I know that we've talked to you about whether there's budget for this, and yes, you have some budget to do this. My, my, my feeling is we have an opportunity now that we have that budget and this will to do it, to do it right, to come up with something that's really going to be useful, and I want to make sure that, you know, that we take advantage of that and don't hurry into a solution that may not be sustainable, may not be supportable, um, and may become outdated quickly, for example. So. Um, that's why I, I have some specific things in my memo that I think are, are, are important to think about. Um, I think, it, as Councilmember Davis asked, I think the ability for council offices to be able to have that feedback. I'd love to be able to say, when somebody calls me and says, we have an encampment here, I'd love to be able to look up and say, well, how many visits have been there in the last year? What were the outcomes? What were, you know, how many times have they been contacted and how many people provide, were, were provided with service? What kinds of services were they provided with? Um, so that I know that information, our office knows that information before we are speaking to the residents. And I think it would be useful to have, in addition, a, a, a tool that your offices, you know, from, from housing and from Beauty by SJ can all share that along with our council offices. So that's kind of what I'm looking for as a tool. And I think um, having some suggestions come back through the Smart Cities Committee to talk about how that's being developed, um, whether it ends up maybe being a third party and not an internally developed program, um, I know you already have the uh, database in um, Salesforce, but it might be that you know we can export that data and use a, a something else that's already supported and provided by third parties. And I've spoken with companies that offer services like that. We ought to look into that and figure out what is the best use for our for our city. Clearly, ideally, we would be able to share that data with the county system. Obviously, I understand the confidentiality issues there, but thinking about how we share that data would be useful. So. I just would like to ask whoever makes a, a, whatever eventual motion there is includes the items in my memo in their motion. Okay, uh, staff, you want to uh, maybe want to respond to this? We 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 did just want and thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Um, this is thoughtful, and we just did want to let you know that we are discussing this with the different cities that have this, the platforms, whether we go off the shelf or custom design. Um, but in terms of outcomes of each interaction we you know i think um again we are in the design phase but major interactions major milestones is something that we think um, may be more um, easier to design and easier for tracking purposes otherwise it becomes really a data um glut and i'll be honest with you some of our, we're inundated in survey one two three right now with data so trying to be smart about meaningful collection of data is something that we'd really like to focus on um, and just understanding sort of the differences between um, encampment trash service, um, outreach, you know, we, we will come back with a, with a scope, but really think that um, we have some work to do to understand what are the goals of the data. Yeah, I just want to be clear, and I, I don't think, and I know there's issues, that it's not necessary that I, as a, that we as a council office necessarily say, well, individual A needs this, individual B is getting this, but there were, there were 15 people when we were there, and we talked to 10 of them, and three of them were provided with a service. That would be useful information for us. So we just, the aggregated kind of large-scale data, I think, even would be useful without necessarily running afoul of specific confidentiality questions or details that we might not need to have access to. That's what I would say. Uh, I'd like to just follow up on questions raised by Councilmember Davidson Cohen on this 
on the databases. Have we had the conversation with the county about whether HMIS could be segregated in a way so that I understand we can't get access to anything that's health related, uh, for the HIPAA and confidentiality reasons, but the reason why they couldn't enable that database to be accessible by the city for identifying unhoused individuals and being able to add to that as we have engaged as we engage with them to identify the kind of services they might need or we haven't had the conversation specifically about this database um, that council's asking for we we the city we do have access so we can of course pull data out and provide summary information um, that doesn't include any um, health related or personal data okay so we do have access today we do have access today the homeless response team has access um, we do plan on going to the county and asking for more access more accounts and more accounts that just have um, look up capability for lack of a better word like i can't go in and change the data but i can run reports and look up data okay and at this so at this point we can actually we cannot supplement data in their database we can only view it is that right um yes i think that's right okay so i, I know these are questions that won't be resolved by us on the dais but I just wonder if we could save a lot of trouble by all using the same database. Um, and I don't know anything about how hard that might be, so I'll stop there. But I, if you I tell mean, me. We literally as met this week as a staff with the city manager's office policy team and have uh, decided we're going to focus some um, detailed thinking energy on outreach and really what's the purpose of outreach and the outcomes and what data should be we be collecting right. given what are we trying to achieve and so you know this is top on our mind and will be a priority for the housing department to specifically look at these contracts to number one better communicate with you all regarding what is the outcome we're trying to achieve and expectations to see if we're aligned and then how do we collect that data and feed it back to you and more regularly but certainly you know our, our focus when we met was on the annual report to really provide meaningful data around uh, outcomes and costs uh, so that we could make better decisions if this is the best use of resources or again communicate better an understanding of what we're able to achieve uh, with this particular strategy of outcome of outreach. Thank you, Jackie. You know, last question about HMIS, I promise, but does it identify, is there a field to identify geographically where that person was last I located? It does, okay. I can imagine that is particularly valuable for us. We're trying to reach out to them to identify housing opportunities that might come up. Um, and, you know, when PATH went out, on, on table three on page eight, um, I think they were looking at the Coyote Creek stretch there. And, and PATH actually identified, they did a survey and they found there were more structures than there were people. <laughs> um, what should that tell us? <laughs> to, I, I'm not sure what to make of that. Does that mean some of these are just being abandoned or do we think they're going to go back the same day or um what i have um come to believe <laughs> is that um somebody living in a 12 by 12 um usually also has stuff <laughs> and we all we kind of have a bedroom and we have a living room in our homes um or a kitchen um and so i think what we're finding is is and we our team see it on a regular basis is your living area is one place and potentially you have another structure for um, your belongings. Okay. I would just add that um, similar to housed people, sometimes you're just not home. 
So it could have been that Path yeah. went there, saw the structure, but no one was there at the time for them to count. Is it one person in this structure? Is it two right. people in the structure? So. Okay, that's cool enough. Um, and then um, I know that a huge constraint for us has been, and particularly as we look at the Guadalupe, the challenge of finding land for the RVs, and for the for the cars, um, and uh, I was hoping we could just get to sort of a thirty thousand foot level. Do we think it's likely that we would get any more private parcels? <laughs> that is large parking lots to be able to go park a lot of RVs. If we made this any more lucrative for the property owner, in other words, if we said, hey, we want a two year lease and we'll pay you 20% more, is that getting, is that the constraint or is there a different set of constraints in, that, in terms of us, if we were to look for private parcels, because I understand public has been, I think we've exhausted, I'm guessing, uh, that, that inventory. If we were looking for privately owned parcels, um, is is that the pathway? It might certainly might help. Um, I, I don't know that we've done a lot of extensive analysis or gotten yeah. <laughs> feedback from property or private property owners to that level. And I, I, and I know that I'm coming at this with having absolutely no understanding of the, the day to day. But I'm wondering if we looked at this in the same way, um, and we literally got a commercial broker <laughs> who went out there and go t went and talked to a whole bunch of, you know, we, Lord knows we, we've got a lot of companies with lots of empty parking lots right now, uh, particularly in this pandemic. Um, I mean, I would certainly be willing to pay more knowing that it could dramatically reduce the cost and the burden on all of us if we actually had a place <laughs> for an awful lot of these RVs and obviously make life a lot easier for the residents them themselves. Um, have we already done that? Have we considered just getting a broker and having those conversations or are we still? We, we haven't done that. Okay. Okay. I, I just throw that out there. Um, Thank you. I, I know there's Mayor, a lot more questions. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, as you know, uh, Jim Arfall has been supporting us in many yeah. of these endeavors, and his one um, little note to me is it's really about funding, right? It is about um, funding. I mean, in many cases, it's about funding. Obviously, it would be about availability, too. Right. Um, but it all comes down in many cases, and I've heard Reagan say this many times <laughs> um, about lots of sites. It's really a funding issue in many cases. Okay. Well, I know that that's usually not welcome news, but in this case it is because we that's a problem we can fix. I mean, we've got a budget process coming up in the next few weeks, and certainly, you know, I'd be very interested in understanding what do we need to do financially to really identify more sites because I think the RVs, I know it's a huge challenge in our neighborhoods, a huge challenge in a whole lot of aspects of what we're doing, and I can't imagine that it wouldn't come out of bargain whatever we'd pay. <laughs> So I, I, anyway, I look forward to that conversation through the budget process. Okay, I know Councillor Davis is revving up for a motion. Uh, Councillor Davis? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to make a motion, but I actually have a few more. Sure, go for it. <laughs> Are oh, there hey, other hey, we do. Hey, hey, Mayor, I'm on, I'm virtual today. This okay. is huge. Uh, okay, know. forgive me. I hadn't gone, I hadn't gone I through everybody Maya's yet. Councillor well. Davis, you mind if I wait and come back through? Please, please okay. go to uh, everyone who's online. Let's, let's first. go to Councilmember Foley, then we'll go to Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you so much. Councilmember Foley. Okay, Councilmember Jimenez, go, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, well I, I'm going to, you know, given that there might be another round, I'm not, I'm going to, I have some thoughts, but also some questions. So I'm going to go through the questions first. Uh, but, but to your point, Mayor, I think as an example, uh, you know, if, if you think back to when we approved the Google project, uh, there was a, uh, a building that they took ownership of. It's an old orchard supply hardware store that essentially today is serving as a parking lot for a local restaurant. And so that parking lot for the most part is empty. And those are things that I think we should really think about as we're going down um, 
the line and thinking about opportunities in which uh, folks that may be willing to help uh, the city, uh, you know, sort of field some some of these locations, if you will. But just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, one, the, the first question I have is related to uh, Vice Mayor Chappie Jones and Council Member Matt Mahan's memo, because I, I wanted to make clear I understood their direction, because I know that staff, <laughs> to the extent everything's approved, they, they take, you know, they, they sometimes take the, well, actually they should take the direction via these memos quite literally. So I wanted to make sure I understood uh, both uh, the Vice Mayor and, and, and Matt's uh, direction. In the body of uh, the memo, and any of them can answer this question, but it says, I think it's the beginning of the second paragraph, it says, we recommend that staff explore various alternatives for RV parking. I just wanted to make sure that that is not moving us away from the, the well, the, the working with VTA, for example, now what, what, what is now District 10, and, and that is just saying explore other things in addition to that. Is that. Is that correct, or are we striving to move away from the work we've been doing with VTA? It, 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 uh, Council Member um, Menes, it's in addition. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's what I was hoping for. Thank you so much. Uh, the other questions I had were, let's see, um, you know, the, I know that uh, I think on page six, forget exactly who touched on this, man, it might have been Andrea, uh, that touched on, uh, we talked about the good neighbor policy in the 12 by 12 area. Um, I guess what I was curious about is this, is that does that 12 by 12 area include just the formal structure, if you will, sort of the tent, or does that include the area that's covered with an individual's belongings? Thank you for the question, council member. It includes the area. Um, it's the, the 12 by 12 should include the person's living structure and belongings. So we ask people to try to confine their living structure, outdoor um, chair, bicycle, et cetera, to a 12 by 12 area. Okay, and then and then anecdotally, would you say that the, that, um, well, well, let me back up a little bit. The reason I'm asking is that, it, you know, you drive around our city and, um, you know, some folks maintain the area relatively clean, uh, which I think is appreciated by many of the folks that call our office, right, as it relates to cleanliness of some of these sites. But in other areas, I think it's to no one's, you know, I, I see it on a daily basis. I can drive down the street from my home to see this. But there, in some cases, it seems like there's just an explosion of trash, if you will, right? And so uh, what I'm what I'm curious about is, Anecdotally, can you tell me how often that's used to to sweep or remove people that just are uncooperative and unwilling to, uh, you know, scale back their operation, if you will? So, yes, if a person has an encampment size that's larger than 12 by 12, we usually don't start with an abatement. We start with an escalated cleanup where we go in, work with the person, ask them what items they want to get rid of so they can reduce and downsize their living space. And that has typically been our approach. We find that most people are very cooperative in an escalated cleanup, but the challenge is that people oftentimes have new items coming in, which continues to expand their encampment location. So it's a process that people may go through on a regular basis. It can be quarterly. Sometimes it may have to be more frequent to, um, depending on the location. Okay, all right. Because Because I think that's one of the that's one of the complaints I get most of is just, you know, house folks or people that live in whatever neighborhood it is saying, look, we don't, you know, we don't want to complain that, that some of the unhoused folks are living in this particular location, but just that the, 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 the trash and things of that nature are unsightly, right? How do we, how do we address that? And so I was glad to see this in place because I was curious if it existed. I just, uh, you know, I, I suspect that you go through this process, they may clean up and then it just happens again and again. And, and so anyway, so, so, okay, thank you for helping me understand that. Uh, the other question I had was on page 11 where it cites the total amount of trash collected. I think it was about 4,500 tons. Um, and it cites dumpster days as one of the methods for collection of that trash, essentially contribution to that 4,500. Are those different dumpster days than the ones we hold in our respective districts, right? Yes, so we have dumpster days that are held in districts um, that are out of the $18,000 that each council office get, receives. We also do additional dumpster days at um, homeless encampments along with our unhoused residents to help clean up as well. 
Okay. All right. Okay, cool. The other question I had is uh, there was, um, you know, I forget what page it's on, but it has the list of all the different source sites. I think one of those are, are now in District 2, which was formerly District 10, which is Branham and Narvez. But what I was curious about is I, all, I remember reading in the document that uh, I think when a site is owned by the city, it helps facilitate, I guess, the, the cleaning or, or creates less barriers to, to maintaining that site. How many of the store sites are city owned? Is it most of them? Is, is it a few of them? Is it? Or how many of the sites where we provide source services are city owned? And if we have that number, great. If we don't, I, I understand. I would say most of the sites currently that are source sites are within the city's jurisdiction, so the property is city owned. And when you say city's jurisdiction, meaning it's within the, the confines of the city of San Jose or that the city of San Jose is an own, is, owns the site? The city of San Jose owns the property. So let's okay. say that there is a source site on, you know, we had a source site on a donut shop parking lot. Mm -hmm. that, it may be a source site, but that's not within the city's jurisdiction, meaning we don't have the authority to do maintenance and maintain it and other services that are needed at the site. Okay, okay, thank you. And then uh, another question is, I think uh, in the memo, it's cited that we're going to be um, opening up or, or, or activating uh, 10 additional new SOAR locations. Is that correct? I think it's on page 16. Yes, that's right. And I was curious, I know there's some, some contract work being done for some amendments related to some of the nonprofit providers, but are you able to provide us a list of some of those, of those additional sites? We don't have the sites uh, for you today, council member, but we do, we have the site selection criteria for you in this memo. And we really did want to be more thoughtful about the SOAR site criteria than when we established the SOAR program a year, year and a half ago when we were simply in um, emergency response mode and trying mm -hmm. to quickly reach as many people who are unsheltered as possible. And so now with this, um, it's a one-time expansion of SOAR that was council directed. And so we are trying to be thoughtful with um, where those locations are. For example, we, in the first iteration of SOAR, we did have a site that was on water district property that we did get permission um, to be there. Some of it was mm -hmm. water district and some of it was city. We did get permission from the water district to be there during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. But since the water district has performed an abatement there. Okay, okay. And that's hence the importance of it being a site that the city owns, right? Because it, it allows Correct. us or prevents it from happening, right? Um, okay, I understand. Um, the other question I had was, I think it was maybe a weekend or so ago, we had a, a fire at an encampment here on the corner of Branham and Monterey Road. Um, and what I realized, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I misunderstood, but there are no outreach services on the weekend. Is that the case? Typically, no, council member. So, um, path or home first. Sorry, council member, you're cutting out. Doesn't go out on the weekends, is that? Or, or do they? So, uh, typically, no. Some, you know, whatever, whether it be a, you know. You're let, cutting in and out. Okay, let me, let me move. <laughs> Give me a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, 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 right. So, typically, no. What would trigger, or who would we call in circumstances in which services were needed? How does how does that work? Can you hear me? I think I got oh, the gist of your question. So I'm going to respond. Yeah. So for after hours Please. services, um, we do realize that that is a gap that we currently don't have. 
So, for example, in the case of a fire and someone's belongings who is unsheltered, they have lost all of their belongings. There is no Red Cross response as there would be for a person who is housed. Um, which is very unfortunate, right? So we yeah. realize that is a gap in our um, crisis response system, and we are working with the county and with Destination Home to fill that gap. That's citywide. I will say uh, for downtown with the council-approved um, new downtown crisis response program, there will be after-hours um, and weekend response. Okay, and can you hear me just fine now, Reagan? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so thank you for that, I appreciate it. And so, you know, Red Cross, when there's a fire, I think they offer, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they may offer housing to folks impacted by, by fires and such. It may be temporary, maybe a hotel. They don't do the same for unhoused folks. Is that is that the case? That's right, council member. That, um, according to them, is not their line of business. Okay, that's unfortunate. I, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, okay. Indeed. All right. The, the other question I had is related. It's something on page 14 and 15 where you uh, or someone, all of you take us through the numbers associated with PATH and Home First, but I think those numbers are from January to June 2021. Are there any current numbers that you that you all can share? Maybe I missed it. I, if I did, I apologize. But... No, those are from um, June. I don't have uh, more current numbers today. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and the very last question I have. Uh, and Council Member Jimenez. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, I gave you a few extra, oh. a little extra time, but. Uh, Can I gonna... just ask this one last question? I promise it's very quick. It's probably going to be promise? yes or no. You promise? I promise. I promise. All right. Because <laughs> I think it may be helpful. I mean, some folks may know it, but the point in time count that took place a few months back or about a month or so ago, are those numbers out? Reagan? No. Okay, when do we expect them to be out? And, and the reason I'm asking is I'm just curious if we're gonna see a significant increase in the houseless population, right? And, and so that's the reason I ask. We anticipate having something publicly out uh, in June. Okay, safe to say that the council will see it before then? Yes, we'd brief the council prior to releasing anything publicly. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I will try and be as succinct as possible and see if I can do everything in one round. Um, so, uh, thanks uh, to everyone. I This was a really informative uh, presentation, and I appreciate the briefings as well. Um, I just wanted to make sure I captured one piece of information. Are we, uh, we're hauling 15 to 20 tons a week from encampments, is that correct? That was a report out on Guadalupe. That was just Guadalupe? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, so I'll uh, put some comments together very quickly. First is um, I wanted to thank Council Member Davis um, for her memo, including Caltrans um, and working with Caltrans. Um, it's a huge issue uh, for Story in 101. In fact, that was, I know she has Meridian in 280, um, but uh, for Story in 101, in fact, it was so dangerous that it was one of uh, the Caltrans property, one of the very few that was actually abated during the height of COVID because people were running out onto the freeway. Um, and so it's some of these Caltrans properties, they're a matter of life and death. And, and some of them, we just need to say they, they cannot have encampments. Um, and so, so that I wanted to mention that and appreciate that. And in a similar vein, I wanted to ask about the county roads. Um, do we have an update on that? I have some county property that we have been going back and forth with the county for three years. And I, I just, we can't keep getting scandalized when unhoused folks uh, get hit and, and die from a collision, a vehicle collision, 
when we collectively are allowing folks to live on freeways, expressways, and the shoulders of an expressway, um, what is the status of our agreement with the county? We are um, getting very close, and I think we should um, have it executed by the end of this month, month of May. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, in terms of the Guadalupe, are we connecting our efforts between Coyote Creek and Guadalupe so that we're not uh, so that we are aligning our efforts on both creeks because they are connected? Councilmember, could you be more specific, specific about the efforts? We don't have- No efforts in terms of vehicle prevention, um, outreach. Um, if we do one thing in Guadalupe and we don't do it in Coyote, in Coyote Creek, um, we're just moving folks back and forth and we have some really large encampments in both creeks that need a significant, um, need significant outreach. Um, they need significant source support, um, significant vehicle pr uh, prevention, I don't know, build outs for lack, <laughs> for lack of a better term. So yeah, I would say the answer to the question is first no, but then also yes. So currently it's not well aligned. Um, the services we have going on in Guadalupe are quite different because of the major encampment that was up there. So there was a ton of investment, as you know, over the last, well, several months to a year. But in the, in the proposed budget, there are resources to start doing those exact sorts of things along the Guadalupe. And Coyote, right? Both, okay, both sorry. creeks, that's the question, right? Yeah, sorry, you mean on the deterrence, right? Okay. And how is the Guadalupe Gardens, how is our outreach, how, how are our efforts, particularly when we, we meaning the council, speed up deadlines and move that, how does that impact services in the rest of the city? What's the bandwidth of all the folks that we're taking and putting in Guadalupe Gardens? How does that impact services in other city council districts, for example? Um, well, from a hiring standpoint, um, as you know, um, a significant amount of funding was put in in June of last year in November, and we are very glad that we are 80% uh, um, filled with our positions, but in terms of our boots on the ground for encampment management, we are at 100%. So um, that was additional um, additional work for um, both the illegal dumping strike team, which we, we have used rapid in some of our efforts at Guadalupe. So um, there shouldn't be an impact um, citywide. Um, and as well as bringing on more community coordinators, community activity workers to do the work of the zones citywide. Um, and again, um, I mentioned it in the presentation, but we are happy to report that we will move from Bi-weekly trash service to weekly trash service by the end of the month. Great, thank you. Um, I, and, just, uh, I, I just I, wanted I just to jump in on the housing side uh, because there will be an impact in terms of the interim housing slots that we have. We're prioritizing every slot that is opened up, you know, effectively uh, last week. Uh, anytime we have a slot opened up in our interim facility, that will go to a person living in Guadalupe Gardens. They will be the priority. Uh, we also have sure stay, so we do need to move people from that facility. So those two sites will take up all of our slots until this site um, is completely emptied out. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Reagan so she can address the any other impacts. Yeah, I actually have a question on that. So, so does that mean that that implies that every tiny home site in the city is full? Is that correct? Uh, are we there, at full capacity? There, at today, there are a few vacancies at, I want to say, three of the six interim housing sites. 
and by by few i mean i i think it's less than a, a dozen and as jackie said those are prioritized uh for people from guadalupe gardens and as more room becomes available because people do move out those um sites those empty beds will go to people at guadalupe gardens will be offered there first Thank Council. you. Thank. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is Andrea. Um, I I missed part of the the question, <laughs> the answer to the question. Um, but as you've seen, as we um, in increase our frequency, as we're doing more work, whether it be dumpster days um, or again the frequency, what we're having an impact on is our um, our yards, um, the amount of hauling that is being done. The impact on Mayberry specifically because Mayberry um, is the only yard that has the scale so that we can actually measure the amount of trash um, that we are collecting. So um, we are having an impact on DOT as well as um, I believe our um, the landfills. So I hope that helps. Thank you. And um, I, just a quick comment on the app database. Um, I just wanted to add my voice to uh, giving thought what the purpose of data, because for example, we know that it takes several touches um, to folks um, in terms of outreach to, to get to know each other, build rapport and, um, and get folks into that next step. So, I'm not sure what the purpose of that would be. So uh, anyway, I appreciate giving more thought to that. Um, I wanted to also um, uh, uh, thank um, the memo that Vice Mayor and Council Member Mayo put forward on RVs. I think it's important um, as part of the conversation around how we manage and deal with RVs um, that we acknowledge that there are some places that we should not allow RVs. Um, for example, I have uh, residences in my district, as I'm sure others do, that have uh, an RV of someone they don't know parked in front of their home, throwing bio waste, threatening some of the folks that live in their home. And um, and so that's that's based on behavior, right? But you know, so that's created some issues. I, uh, in an industrial area, we have um, areas where there are uh, RVs, there are some accidents that were caused by RVs parking along lines of sight and in industrial areas where trucks of distribution services, uh, services coming in and out, that created some issues. And so um, I think that we, also need to look at RVs. Um, and I will go ahead and stop there. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there and I look forward to hearing more questions from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, council member. And I only make one mistake a day and I made one and I skipped council member Foley. So I'm gonna, the mayor is allowing me to call on you, council member. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, vice mayor. And uh, thank you to my colleagues for their very thoughtful memos and to the presentation from our staffs. And Olympia, welcome to District 9. Um, look forward to coming over and visiting you there. This obviously is an issue that impacts all of our residents, both unhoused and housed. It's an issue that we hear about oh, probably 50% of our council day is related to issues around the unhoused. And mostly it's uh, the trash, the bio waste, the noise, the hazard, fire hazard, and the very serious concerns about the re residents, the housed residents that are nearby. So I have actually some very similar questions that have been asked already. I just wanna follow up a little bit uh, in regard to the setbacks and the 12 by 12. You've referred to 12 by 12 many times and I'm trying to envision how big that is. It's not a very big spot size, but we do have places, I know everybody has these encampments that 
it's so much more than 12 by 12. It's an actual structure with two stories with uh, solar panels and it looks like a condominium. Um, and housed residents are wondering how that can be next to them it, when of course it's not permitted, of course it's way bigger than 12 by 12, but when you look at 12 by 12, if it's two stories, are you looking at 12 stories as the, or 12 by 12 by the footprint, or are you counting the second story and how do you handle that kind of a situation? Thank you for the question, council member. So when we come out and find these large encampments, um, if there's a significant amount of plywood, if there's a significant amount of propane tanks, if there's two stories, those are the first sites that we typically address because they can be dangerous, as you can imagine, for the staff that are actually out there as well. They don't want something to fall on them or they're helping someone clean up or other issues to happen. So typically we work with the person and say we need you to downsize and it's usually taking off the first level. Most people understand it. And after a couple weeks of having engagement with them, they'll allow us to break those down. Our challenge has been not working with people to break them down, but they tend to come back much quicker than we can get back out to then kind of go through the work once again. That was gonna be my follow-up question. So, just Don, did clarify, you wanna say something? Yeah, just to clarify your specific question, it is the footprint that we're looking at. Okay, so, so Olympia, when you have that situation that they take down the first story and they have, now they've converted it to a 12 by 12 and then a neighbor reports it to us and then we report it to you. How long does that ex assessment take? How, what can you walk us through the process of when you're involved and how long before resolution? Because that's what the house residents are looking for and we're the intermediary. So we always need to know what's happening and what the timeline is. And, and I, your, your staff is really good at working with us, but can you kind of tell me about the assessment process and how long that takes to remediate a situation like that? Yes, when we receive an initial complaint, it is then assigned to our team that does the assessment. An assessment, depending on how many we have, can take up to three weeks. Once the team assesses the site, they usually determine it needs an escalated cleanup. It'll just continue in weekly trash service or cash for trash, or it needs an abatement. Then it takes about a week to schedule that because they need to post, let outreach come out and have contact with the person, and then kind of we do that action. So it can be from the time a person reports, a short turnaround time may be two to three weeks, a little bit longer could be three and a half, possibly four weeks, depending on the time of year and the types of abatements that we have scheduled. Okay. Thank you. Andrea. Can I just add, sure. it's a really good point because I've learned um, as we get into the hotter days, um, that is that actually will slow our work and we need to um, understand that we can't have people working outside um, in those conditions. So um, again, what we're hoping to, to move to is communicating, having some expectations around that three week time frame because we wanna honor the housing outreach process as well. Um, because every opportunity, even an escalated cleanup is an opportunity, you know, to um, recontact that person or confirm that they, um, whether they've had a VI spadat or not. So um, again, communication though is our goal. If we're not gonna meet the three weeks, um, uh, we would communicate that as well. Okay, so, so I see a, a lot of your plan centers around enforcement of the 12 by 12 in part, and the 12 by 12 footprint is tied to the setbacks or should be tied to the setbacks. How are you enforcing that? Do you, are you notified by us or, and um, you have a, a resident who complains is everything complaint driven? Are you driving by? Do you have a team driving by regularly to determine what's happening at your your normal encampments and your uh, the source sites in particular, but not just because we have non-source sites on our creeks that are problematic, and I'll get get to that in a minute. But so, do you? Uh, how do you handle those the setbacks and in relation to the twelve by twelve and all of that? and mitigation. 
our teams visit our encampments, they're transitioning from biweekly to weekly service. So typically escalated cleanups and abatements are usually noticed first by the team because they're at the site on a regular basis and they're usually communicating with someone to get them to cooperate. And then if they don't, it leads to escalated actions. We also get complaints. I will tell you probably 90% of the complaints we receive, the team is already aware of it and have usually started to work on it by the time we receive it from the public or from a council office. Okay. And, and what kind of uh, strategies do you have for cleaning? Uh, in uh, Many of our creek beds are uh, under the control of Valley Water. So how is the partnership working with our inner agencies, particularly Valley Water and then County, of course, Caltrans? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the Valley Water uh, relationship um, ha is, is healthy <laughs> and good. Um, we have multi layers of communication right now, and I would say at our um, kind of the program level, um, I receive in Olympia, we receive sort of a joint quarterly development of projects that would be mutually beneficial to both Valley Water and San Jose, where we're sharing um, equipment, labor, um, and other resources. Um, so we've gone from about, I think after the winter, we went from six joint. Um, uh, uh, escalated actions a quarter, and this last quarter we've done about 11, 11 to 13. So um, so that's going very well on the ground. And then um, at a city level and at a Valley Water sort of executive level, we're now having regular um, coordination and conversation um, about not just encampment management, but a whole host of um, necessary and important conversations. That's good. And we've found that at the district level that Valley Water is very receptive and working well with us too in certain areas. I wanna talk about a little bit about our waterways and our uh, environmentally sensitive areas. Last year, when we did the road, road map, we talked about having a plan come back to us about how we were going to address environmentally sensitive areas to these encampments. When is, because what we're seeing is there's encampments along our creek beds. Uh, the occupants are cutting down trees so that they can cross over the creeks, you know, even though there's no water in the creeks, but they're still cutting down the trees, which is uh, counterintuitive to what we want to do to protect our environment and our trees and our, um, our waterways, not to mention the bio waste and other huge environmental impacts on our creeks. So, when will we be seeing a proposal on how to address the creek bed, the creeks in particular in our environmentally sensitive areas? I'll start by saying that um, as we put forward in the memo that we do want to use our resources that we've been given this year to create a new, brand new service along Coyote. So we are dedicated as a city to the three um, focus zones in the direct discharge trash control trash reduction plan. Um, and so we, we are upping um, our resources and to again, remove trash from encampments um, in those three areas. What we're doing with environmental service um, services department is understanding, so we're under the current permit and as we understand the requirements for the new permit, we will have um, next year to plan for that and understand sort of how that would um, really help us to, to design a creek strategy. Um, but we also have to understand kind of like Guadalupe, right? Um, when we do um, clear folks, if we must do that, you know, there will, there will be impact. So planning for that um, is gonna take some time. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, I know in your, uh, in your memo and it was specific about Coyote, but is Guadalupe included in there or I, I didn't see a specific detail about what is the intention with Guadalupe, which are, is the one that backs to much of my district. Right. Yeah, I can I can address that. So the so a lot of this is going to be driven by the direct discharge plan that Andrea was referencing. Um, the three areas along Coyote are areas that were identified in that permit the last time, so we're committed to those as a city. So that's where we're starting and making sure we can gain better ground than we have been um, and demonstrate to the board that 
we're taking it seriously, the very concerns you brought up, environmental, bio, all that. Um, however, in the new permit, it's going to apply to all of our direct discharge areas. So that'll be the Guadalupe, that'll be Los Gatos Creek. That's all of them. Okay. All the creeks are, you know, we have, what, over 100 tributaries and little creeks all over the place. It includes all of that because all of that's the watershed going into the bay. So the permit is all inclusive. The question will be, how far reaching will the permit be this next time? And we, we're just not there yet. We're still in that planning phase, working with the board in their, I think their direction is going to come out in the middle of this year, July or something like that. So we'll have a better sense of, here's what we're going to require you to respond to. And then we have to develop a plan in response to that, to the water board to say, this is what we're going to do in these creeks to help. Okay. And I, I do see that my time is up, so I'm just going to quickly make a statement about fires and how critical it is that we uh, do everything we can to protect our residents from fires. There, we know we're in a drought situation and on, along the creeks. These are steep embankments and they're very difficult for our firefighters to get down into. So anything we can do to make the setbacks even greater along the creeks and in areas that are not accessible or easily accessible for our, for our firefighters. And then uh, any, any other thing we can do to prevent fires in, along our, in our, at our encampments. And with that, I think I've exceeded my 10 minutes by at least two or three. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Councilmember Davis and Councilmember McCullen. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Columbus Park, and I would refer my colleagues to page three of my memo to ensure, and you even heard some public commenters talking about Columbus Park. What was uh, news to me, and I want to make sure everybody is aware, uh, Columbus Park itself, the boundaries of it that are on page three of my memo, are, is not currently included in our direction to staff. As you see, it is immediately adjacent to the area that is being cleared, and the public often refers to the area as Columbus Park and assumes that the entire part that we're talking about, Columbus Park and Guadalupe Gardens, will be abated and part of phase three. That is not currently in staff's plan, and so I want to make that, is that correct, John? Yes, that is correct, but I, I, I would enjoy the opportunity to comment on that once you finish with your comments. Okay. So the, the issue for me is that the proximity to Columbus Park, of Columbus Park to Guadalupe Gardens, um, is al it's already being used by our unhoused residents to relieve uh, the saturation from phase three, and I've been out there multiple times, and staff has confirmed that. So there is a very real possibility that Columbus Park will become an encampment proportional to what we've seen or what we have in phase three um, in Guadalupe Gardens and potentially spill back into the, the 40 acres that we are now uh, clearing because of the FAA regulation. So I'm very concerned about basically the possibility of nullifying what all of the staff's efforts have done to comply with the FAA regulations and which is why I'm advocating to keep uh, active efforts to keep that park clear in addition to the 40 acres. Of course, I would like Columbus Park to have foot traffic to prevent further encampments from moving in. We currently don't have um, activation in that park and the park quality, if you saw, if you were happen to be looking, it actually has the lowest um, I can't remember, it's not the park's assessment, condition assessment anymore, whatever the new uh, assessment is, it has the lowest score of any park in the entire city. Is that correct, John? Yes, park condition assessment, you had it right. Thank you. So there, right now, if, you, if you've gone to the park recently, there are at least five areas within the park that have about 13 structures. I want to know from staff, are those individuals part of the original assessment by Home First and housing? Are they included in the 131? No, they are not. All right. So the reason that I have included Columbus Park as a request to add to the abatement 
for phase three is that I'm very concerned that what we're all talking about clearing out is not what I know I thought as a council member until I went out there and staff pointed out, and here's the line, and it's literally five more steps, and we're not going to be clearing that part, and the public does not know that. So I wanted to make that very clear. I understand that we we can argue that we want to keep the area for more encampments moving in and therefore should be proactive in abating. So I just think we should be more proactive in abating that site as well uh, at, as part of phase three. Um, in addition to that, I have added that I want to keep the community gardens activated and that the there are a number of people who want to go there and be there on a regular basis. There are some volunteers as uh, PRNS knows who come every day, but they have been tr having trouble finding parking because the uh, Walnut Street one hour parking is not enforced right now. So I'm asking for a plate either to actually enforce that parking or for PRNS to make parking available to the community gardens folks. So that's, I, I'm, I wanna give John a chance to comment, but that's what's kind of the basis for my memo. Thank you, council member. And, and first of all, I just wanna be clear, I'm not disagreeing, but I'm asking for some friendly consideration here. So with respect to Columbus Park, uh, it, has, it has not ever been included because it was already a city park. Um, however, um, our preference would be not to have the direction to absolutely abate, but let us let phase three play out because some of the big things that are gonna happen in phase three is the street on the north, that's Asbury, which is full of RVs and cars and campers, will be cleared. Walnut Street will be cleared. Irene Street, which is on the east side, will be cleared. Um, so all of those things are gonna be moved out of the park and they'll be required to leave. And then parking enforcement will, re, will, will begin again. We have put a pause on parking enforcement ever since we started this project because people had to have a place to park. We're trying to get them to park on the street and not in the dirt and not down by the creek. Um, so we had to sort of make that deal with everybody that, hey, we're not gonna enforce these, these no overnight parking rules and things like that because it just didn't make sense to sort of randomly pick people while we were going through this process. So by the end of phase three, I think we'll have a better sense of what's going on in Columbus Park and who's remaining or wanting to remain. It may mean that that's a managed space Right, just like many of the other encampments we've talked about. Um, but we'd like to have that flexibility to let that play out a little more versus an absolute saying you must abate. Um, and then with respect to the parking by the garden, and there are, I think, 114 gardeners that go out of that garden. It is a popular garden. Um, and, and I'm very familiar, you know, Bob Sippel, as you know, um, he contacts me very regularly about it. Um, we can look at how we can fix that, but again, we're not planning on doing parking enforcement until we clear phase three. So we could try to create some space, but there's a lot of times the, the people who park aren't really that interested in what signs we put up or what color we paint the curb. Um, so um, we wouldn't anticipate doing enforcement of that until the end of phase three when we're making everybody leave kind of at, not necessarily at the same time. Hopefully we got a lot of RVs in, in safe parking Right, and we've found other solutions, so it's not just everybody goes at once. Uh, but there's there's a lot of dynamic to this, so just a little bit softer of an edge would help us. And then I, I'm I'm guessing housing wants to talk about your item two A, which is including them in the housing solution. Um, I don't know if Reagan or Jackie wants to address that aspect. I'll address that aspect. Um, I I think including it does create some challenges for us because the county has communicated that they are providing the additional housing and resources in the 40 acres because we have a notice from the FAA that says we're out of compliance, but they would not be willing to provide any additional housing or resources to other sites in the city, whether it's Columbus Park or the Guadalupe River Park Trail, uh, because they do believe it's an equity issue. 
Um, and then I think even if we were to just find the budgetary resources for housing, uh, I think that still presents a problem if the housing doesn't exist. Understood. On the flip side, and, and I understand everything you both have said um, and sympathize with it. On the flip side, we have, again, a growing outcry from our residents to see something being done. And if we are telling them we are going to clear this site and we actually pull the rug out from under them and don't clear the entire site as expected, it looks bad for all of us. It looks like we're ineffective. And so I, I again, and I know that you, you know this since I've been out there with you many times, I am sympathetic to what you're saying and I understand the difficulty. We have to, I think we have to forge ahead and I would respectfully ask my colleagues to support me on this because we are, getting so much frustration and we feel so much frustration about this we really honestly we need the win <laughs> and if we don't get it 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 looks like we didn't keep our promise to the but, public yeah then i just want to be clear that there's absolutely no way that we can get uh, within the time frame that we have outlined in this memo in September, the additional uh, people in Columbus Park. So if you would like us to do that, our strategy would be putting them into our, uh, moving them into our interim facilities, um, and we'd have a better idea after doing this work, like the, the number of people we're able to, moving, to move in per month, given the slots that open up, um, because the only alternative then is that that site would be abated and people would then move into the whatever the surrounding area is to Columbus Park. And they would come back unless we're fully able to um, secure these sites. Because what we've created essentially is just push them out, but they just come back. So uh, unless we have a security structure, a fence, um, and if they don't have a place to go because there's no shelter and there's no interim sites because we've used all those slots for the people in the 40 acres, um, they will just scatter into the businesses and neighborhoods. Understood. And what I heard as well is that we have many, much direction here about safe parking sites and RV sites, which would alleviate some of that 131 because there are people who are in RVs who may not even be wanting housing from what I have heard because they say they have a home in their RV and just need a place to park it. So I, again, I understand the difficulty and my office will continue to work with you. I think you all know Diana is working full time on this to help you find mechanics, to help find safe parking sites, to figure out solutions we're working on the park to see how much we can accelerate the prototype park and the Columbus Park work to ensure that that is activated, at least the, the work on the park and Guadalupe Gardens, the prototype park are, are accelerated as much as possible to get that work done so that there are people out there. In addition to asking for additional um, activation while you're clearing on Columbus Park. So again, I understand the difficulty, I understand the frustration, I share it, and so do all of our residents. And so I'm, I'm, I am pleading with you and I am pleading with my colleagues to support me in this. We have to find a way to get it done so that we all know that we can do it. So with that, I'm gonna move Councilmember Cohen's memo and my memo, which incorporates all my other colleagues' memos and 
I'll add uh, just the um, amend my my memo slightly for item 2A that said come back to May, in May to actually align with the, the mayor at all memo uh, timeline of coming back to us with a work plan in June. Thank you. Council Member, if I can uh, ask a clarifying question, is, or not a clarifying question, but ask Nicole to just comment on the expedited timeline for the park to October the 22nd. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, with regard to Columbus Park and accelerating um, construction of that, uh, the Public Works team is hard at work on that. We are not in a position right now to, uh, the current status of that is our last community meeting is in May. Uh, the EIR still needs to be completed, and it's a $20 million project to rebuild um, Columbus Park. So there's a significant design effort associated with that. Our current schedule has us completing design in late 2023, uh, and accelerating faster than that will probably be extremely challenging for us. Um, so we wanted to just make that clear. Um, and I think in terms of accelerating other improvements in the park, I think we're, we're in the same boat. We have to address a number of issues related to CEQA as well as um, FAA compliance. So we're, we're doing everything we can to move those projects as quickly as we can, but there's a number of factors that are, that are, uh, that are conspiring to, to dictate some schedule. Understood, and what I'm asking for is to continue to work with my office for some creative uses for that park in the meantime, so that we can activate it. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Um, Lee, did you want to comment? I do, I just wanted to offer a suggestion and appreciate the points, Council Member Davis, that you're bringing up. Um, but having gone through um, this quite a bit with the team and looking at the resources over the last few days, I would suggest instead of including everything in phase three, because we need to be super efficient with the resources that we have at hand, that we start planning for a phase four that coincides with us being able to focus on the situation that we're faced with today. But starting that planning work now and if additional interim beds come in early, we can move forward with phase fours, you know, later on in phase three. But I am worried about our ability to do the work and commit to the numbers that the team is outlining today with the expansion. Yes, sir, did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I will say I'm loath to make that, uh, <laughs> to make that amendment, um, but, in the interest of being collaborative, I will agree to include Columbus Park as a phase four, but I will ask that that, add, that is added to the work plan that we've requested come back to us in June. Yep, absolutely, thank you. And I'll okay. accept that too. Okay, it's all right with Council Member Foley. Uh, Council Member Cohen. Um, yeah, let me, first I'm gonna start by, I, something that the mayor mentioned earlier uh, about private sites for RV parking. And I, I've been very frustrated, it's not anybody's fault in this room, but by the fact that we've been talking about RV parking for a long time and we still don't have really many sites for RV parking and there's a lot big issue throughout our city. And I will say that in our office, when we have a developer who has a piece of property that says it's a few years away, we're asking them directly, can we use your site temporarily for RV parking? And we've actually had one, at least one who said, yeah, I think that may work. And we haven't gotten to the point where we can begin to talk about it, but we're hoping that that can happen. So I encourage people to have those conversations. But I do like the idea of a systematic approach also, of being able to go out and talk to private property owners. Now, I did have a conversation with SVLG about some of the North San Jose sites. I'd love to be able to use some of them. There's concern, of course, about, you know, they're marketing their sites, they're trying to sell them. They don't, it's hard to, to, to use them for something else while they're also in the process of trying to do that for, but with the right financial incentives, it's possible we could do that. And I like, I like the idea. I don't know if it necessarily should be part of this motion today, but I think we ought to consider that going forward. Um, I'm concerned a little bit about scope creep <laughs> on these, uh, on these, on the situation. We've been, you know, we've been focused on what we have to do for the FAA, obviously, and that should be primary job number one, but, um, we're here now because we couldn't get it done by the June 30th and we're asking to move it to September and now we're adding 
additional scope, and I understand we've just added it as a phase four instead of as um, part of the same one, but it still concerns me a little bit. Um, and that, that goes for not just the suggestion in Councilmember Davis's area, but also the Children's Discovery Museum is being part of that as well. That's another piece of scope that, that um, you know, kind of focuses resources in, in, uh, on a specific site. And yet, yes, we, we um, as Councilmember Davis says, need the win. We need to show people that we can do this, but I think we need to show people across the city that we can do it and not just in one area of the city. And at some point, we're gonna, some of us are gonna say yes. And we're telling our, I mean, I'm telling residents, look, the city's focused right now on Guadalupe Gardens. We're not gonna have as many um, resources in some of these other areas, but we can't indefinitely um, say that all beds go to one part of the city and not to other parts of the city. Um, again, I'm not asking for us to abate, but I'm asking for us to be able to say at some point, there are places, other places in the city where people need beds. I, I'm also concerned there will be people who are going to relocate into the other parts of the city when, when this happens in Guadalupe Gardens and Columbus Park and other places, which will exacerbate the problem in some of our districts where we're telling people we can't do something right now. Um, so, I, so I'm concerned about going beyond the scope of what was already in the work plan at this point. I think it makes more sense to say, let's come back with a further discussion about other places in the city and how we address them once we solve this problem. That would be my preference than to sort of add that scope right now, especially since we haven't spoken about other places in the city that may also have severe need. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, support most of this, this um, motion, but not, not adding those extra pieces of scopes explicitly at this time. Um, Okay, so that's that's my comment. I mean, that's how I that's how I feel. I'm not sure what the, you know, if it's a friendly amendment to say let's let's refer this for further discussion as opposed to putting it in as an explicit scope here. Maybe you know I feel more comfortable, but I'm afraid of sort of continuing to direct specific sites to be the focus in an ongoing manner. And I do like do you know the thought of saying let's see how it goes at phase three before we begin to say that the you know Columbus Park is the next site of importance. Um, I think that that's the approach we should take, given that we had that specific reason for the focus on those sites. Uh, Councilmember Davis, I, I think I heard a request for a friendly amendment. Uh, let me let me try yeah. to see if I could fashion that amendment in some way that uh, upon the conclusion of phase three, that there would be a return to the council to determine whether to go forward with phase four or, or some variation. Is that is that right, Councilor Collins? Yeah, I think that would probably be a better compromise in terms of being able to make sure we're doing phase three that we have to do, but not dedicating resources to figuring out right now what the next phase is or how to do the next phase before we even know how successful we've been here. I, I mean, I'm concerned, obviously, and I've been really asked this question about being here again in in August or September, saying, well, we're now we're not going to hit this next date, and we have to move it again. So I think. You know, we really want to focus on making sure we hit this next date, and uh, and not necessarily detract our resources away from from meeting that goal. But knowing, obviously, as you all know, you're going to still be getting, you know, calls from those of us in other districts where we have some issues that need addressing, and and you know, we can't necessarily say no, we're not going to clean up a, a you know a site that's become a, a problem elsewhere, right? So that's my. That's what I want to make sure that we have the resources to do as we move this process forward. All right, Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Cohen, uh, with all due respect, I have other sites in my district as well. The reason that I think it's important for us is that this has garnered probably national attention, but certainly local attention. And if it's not cleaned up completely, including Columbus Park, whether we as we, I've said, it's okay, let's add it to a phase four. If it's not cleaned up, we will hear about it everywhere. I hear about the FAA site in Evergreen. I hear about the FAA site in Almaden. Everywhere I go in this city, people are talking about the airport site. So respectfully, I think it's important to include it in the work plan. I'm fine with adding it to a phase four, but I, I'm gonna decline your friendly amendment. Okay. Councilor Cohen, anything further? 
Um, I mean, I guess the next question would be if we can bifurcate that discussion so that we can kind of, I, I, you know, I can support the rest of the work plan and motion without necessarily supporting that detailed, uh, that addition to the scope. So I guess the question would be if you'd be willing to bifurcate that motion. I'd like to hear from my other colleagues before I before I accept that okay, idea. We'll suspend that request and come back to it. Councilmember Frost. Yeah, thank you. I had a suggestion, and this is kind of how we um, managed it in the memo, Mayor, that that I signed on with with you uh, and our our colleagues here, Councilmember Davis and Cohen included, and, and uh, Vice Mayor Jones. So on recommendation two. Um, we made the suggestion, and this also was sort of uh, a bit of scope creep, um, but we made the, the, the recommendation on those 40 plus individuals for the city manager to produce an MBA on that. Um, and then we specified that that should not interfere with the proposed schedule that we, we had, that we were working under under FAA. So it sounds like we're, we're, we're kind of going down that path, but that was what my suggestion was gonna be, was that that, that would allow us to have this discussion, it sounds like the city manager is calling it a phase four, um, but I think the direction of an MBA would give us an opportunity to then talk about the resources needed. And, and then similarly, I think I really, you know, liked the sentence about it shouldn't interfere with it. So that way it makes it very clear that, look, these are two different efforts, right? We, we, we recognize the scope that we were trying to work under and we can allow staff to still finish that work. And then knowing that we have additional challenges both north and south of, you know, the FAA required area. So is that, I, I don't know if that's along the lines of where you were going with it, Lee, were you expected on coming back with an MBA or under the current motion or or no? Were you, when you discussed a phase four, how, how would you bring that forward? Yeah, so I think we could now start planning for a phase four. And I think part of that that planning work that I would expect from the team is if resources are needed, and we're in that period of time. So I'll, I'll defer to staff if they expected to come forward in an MBA, but that was my expectation. But really bifurcating that work and the expectations that staff has laid out today with the resources available in the timeline from that conversation, because I don't see how the team can work any harder to produce extra outcomes without those resources. Yeah, so just to clarify from the housing department's perspective, we would have to have additional resources. So whether that would mean the reallocating of Measure E funds uh, towards more rapid rehousing resources, uh, or if, and we would have to ensure the current contracts had capacity to take on more people. Um, and then it just occurred to me, you know, we do have Lot E is opening up. And so, you know, one of the things that we brought forward in this plan was we said this plan was not connected to Lot E anymore. We had uh, disconnected um, that, but that would have to be a resource that we would have to have available to us in order to continue to provide opportunities for people to move quickly, if that is what you, you all desire. Thank you. So it does sound then appropriate that maybe we use similar language, if you're comfortable with that, Councilmember Davis, as we used in the joint memo on recommendation two, that it actually asked for this phase four, which includes Columbus Park, to come back maybe as part of that work as well. Yes, thank you. I will accept that amendment. Okay, and then I didn't hear within your motion, did you happen That's to- That's okay with Council Member Fuller. Oh, I'm okay. sorry, yeah. Did you happen to include uh, my solo memo? If not, could you? Yes, I did. Okay, thanks. That was it. It included all the memos, just to be clear. Everybody's in the pool. Everybody. All right. Okay. Um, any other comments from my I, colleagues online? I have a question. Yes, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you. Um, so I just want to make sure so that I can support. Uh, it's the compromise is to move forward with the MBA. So could you please restate the motion, Councilmember Davis? Sure. So it is moving all the memo. My my motion moves all the memos with uh, the clarification that Columbus Park will come back as part of the MBA process, as well as the Guadalupe River Trail individuals living there as well. 
Okay, great. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for the compromise. I thank my colleagues for that. I, um, I think adding that additional information uh, and flexibility on what resources it takes when um, is helpful uh, because I'm, I'm pretty concerned about not having beds for the rest of the city. So that's a big concern. So I appreciate the opportunity to see what resources would be needed to move forward and what that phase four would look like. Um, so I just wanna thank everybody and I'll be supporting the motion. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Reynolds. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm gonna take us back because I've been waiting uh, to make these questions. I know we, it sounds like we, we've got a motion on the floor, uh, but I have a couple of questions. So I, um, I know that there was a couple of children at the Guadalupe Gardens um, site earlier this year. Um, and I think uh, our, our team did a wonderful job in making sure that those families got connected uh, to some interim housing, hopefully, which led to permanent housing. Um, my question is, and, and thank you for that. My question is, what what is our typical protocol? How do we respond, and how does how do the contractors also respond when they see children when they're doing outreach or interacting with our unhoused community? Do they prioritize uh, those individuals that have children? What what is the typical protocol there? Hi, council member, we do have a um, written protocol for when outreach teams encounter families with children. The first, I'm, I'm gonna summarize uh, a protocol, but the first step is that the outreach team, whether it's Life Moves outreach team or Abode or a county outreach team, that outreach team calls our centralized hotline for screening and placement. So we need to understand the household size and the number of children. Um, Bill Wilson Center, who operates that central hotline, they then call our family providers to arrange immediate shelter. If none of the sites uh, have an immediate opening, a family can be placed in an emergency motel site. Mm -hmm. um, and, and none of our family placements are in um, congregate settings, I would say, not big rooms. Um, all of our sites have family, private rooms for families. If a family refuses um, assistance, the outreach team will continue to engage that family. Um, we don't take no for an answer. We keep going back. Um, if the family is in a vehicle, the protocol is to also uh, to contact Amigos de Guadalupe, their safe parking outreach team, who will offer and encourage the family um, to participate. Um, we we tend that's to use if they have a car, Reagan. That's if they have a car. Then mm -hmm. we have an avenue for people in vehicles. If they are unsheltered, um, then it's we try and go with a um, we call it temporary housing because sometimes folks are um, when you say the word shelter, I think there's um, misnomers about you know big warehouses or places that are unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, we do often encounter parents who are fearful of um, accepting services be because, not that they don't want services, but they are very fearful of having their children taken away from them. Right. Um, so uh, we do have a, a written protocol for our mm -hmm. outreach teams and our central hotline. And the last thing I'll, I'll note, Councilmember, is we do mm -hmm. have an ability to do 
placements outside of traditional like business hours oh great that's the next question i was going to ask you because i imagine you know the a child or children waiting for the whole weekend so i'm glad to to hear that um what what happens if the family says um no thanks to um any and all of the options that are laid out what what is our response is our response to then um include uh, uh esca escalate the response or do we switch provider and have maybe somebody else try to connect with the family i'm just trying to figure yeah, out what, as i what... said we don't we don't take no for an answer we keep going back and keep trying to engage and sometimes that does mean council member uh doing a warm handoff to a different provider mm -hmm. if it makes sense it is um driven by by the family and kind of their circumstances and needs okay and and at what point would you um would you say and have we ever um done a a child abuse report is this something that when ultimately you know i'm sure that every parent wants to accept the service that they're being offered um but i'm just thinking about the worst case scenario um so that we're prepared for it do we have a worst case scenario in terms of protocol we do and our um providers do um, mandate or do intervene if there are um, unsafe conditions for minors or unsafe behavior that they've observed. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm trying to, we don't talk about it enough. I mean, we, we know, I know that we are targeting families and there is a very uh, coordinated and comprehensive approach from the county uh, as well as from, from our, our city. Um, we just haven't talked um, enough about some of those kiddos that are out there. And we know that there's quite a bit because we we know that those numbers from us from the schools and from the um the counts that we do i just um i wanted to make sure that we are all on the same uh page about that um the other question that i had or the other consideration i'd like to um ask for is and this is something that uh, Council Member Cohen was getting to with his comments about um, making sure that there's enough resources for um, folks outside of a, um, a targeted area. Um, and I'd like for us to think about how we factor equity into the decisions of abatement. Um, is it is it because we have a lot of attention? Is it because you know we have a requirement? Obviously, this is also an outside agency demanding it um, from us. But this is a um, a very different kind of a case. In general, I'd like to know how we are making those decisions of abatement. Is it the number of calls that we get and complaints? Is it because there's a, you know, a certain number of people there or um, what is that criteria that we use? Thank you, Council Member Arenas. Um, what we're looking at are sort of a, a multitude of risk factors. So I'll just say, no, it's not the number of calls um, is, is not a determination of abatement. Um, it would be based on um, location conditions and we do want to create some level of objectivity to it so again that's why we're going to be looking at the um, a risk factor um, checklist and I do believe um, 
I think we all, we will bring an equity lens to it because I think a lot of the work that we do, um, you know, we're, we're looking at it that way. And as we develop this, um, we just need to figure out how we document that and understand um, how that's woven into the determination. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I, I'd also like to make sure that when we have overnight warming locations that we have um, a certain priority for some of those fo of some of those areas um, after um, uh, because there is there is um, I think people set up camp around the the owl locations and I that's what I've noticed in in our owl um, and uh, you know e even in the middle of the street um, and we've had to have VTA to um, replace a bench just this week um, and so I I don't know that um, everybody's getting the good neighbor um, information and if they are um, not abiding by it and if they're not abiding by it I don't know if that um, is a determinant to um, have it what 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 kind of approach that creates um, when the folks are not um, complying with with that good neighbor policy. Council member, um, uh, do you have a question that we can answer directly related to that? Well, yeah, that's the question. The question is what happens? So I can jump in. So uh, when we first started uh, working with the city manager's office, we had come up with a good neighborhood policy and a program that was designed to provide additional support to any uh, communities that were accepting these types of facilities, whether it was owls or we only had tiny homes at the time. And so we literally drew a map and we did um, in, we did additional cleanup in those areas. We had additional outreach in those areas. We invited people that were living in those areas to come into the facilities that we were in. And then COVID-19 hit. Um, and then all of our resources have been going to the COVID-19 response. And so we have not been able to uh, operate that program anymore. That program uh, went away. Uh, uh, as a result of COVID-19. And so um, that is something that we are not um, offering at this point in time. Okay. Um, well, I think that some of the OWL locations might, um, when we think about um, the criteria of, of attend, uh, the criteria that we take into account to either provide service or to provide abatements or uh, just to have a more comprehensive response. Um, we need to make sure that the, the OWL's locations are um, in consideration or have some level of priority over others so that the neighborhood can continue to welcome OWL centers um, and that they, you know, aren't asking to, um, they're not part of creating a, a greater issue for that community. Instead, this is an actual solution. Um, so anyways, that, that is my, um, my feedback and my response and, and my questions. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, any other questions? Uh, anybody want to submit another memo? Mary, do we do have a clarifying question on, on the on the motion? Um, does does the motion include uh, the acceptance of all the memos that were submitted? Okay, so we did have a question on. on Regrettably for staff, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, uh, in regards to the the one submitted by Councilmember Davis, uh, it's uh, number four: expedite the construction timeline for prototype park to October twenty twenty two. That's probably one that uh, that we will not be able to 
achieved. So we, we kindly ask that that be. Uh, do, do you want to offer, uh, just for council's benefit, what you believe is something staff can do? I'll defer to Nicole Wood. Uh, sure. Um, I, I think at right now our current schedule has us uh, designing and getting the dog park under construction um, in Q1 of 2023. Um, and, and I think that's achievable and in striking distance. Um, I think committing at this very moment to the rest of the prototype park assets is a little bit more tenuous. So I, I think the an alternate that proposes dog park in 2023 early 2023 is fine. Okay, uh, let's make to the motion. I, I would just want to be clear. Um, when we had a briefing about this, I'm when I'm talking about here is that construction begins, not that construction ends by October 2022. Yeah, I think the construction schedule that we currently had, I'm going to ask Matt to help me out. Um, but I think it was bidding in, in October. Thank you, Nicole and Councilmember Davis, Matt Cana, Director of Public Works. Yes, we have, you know, we definitely talked about with you the desire to try and begin construction on the dog park by October of this year. Um, as we've been looking more into that the past few days, there's going to be a lot of challenges with that. Um, one is at a minimum, when we have a dog park, we want to have water um, for the dogs. That'll cause a little bit more design work. Additionally, there's some FAA. Um, coordination that we need to do um, and and survey work and design work so we're we are going to be pushing very hard and we've had a meeting even earlier today with the team and the survey team we are pushing really hard we're going to get the survey started this week we're going to get the design is starting this week um, and so we are moving and we're going to push really hard on this project but uh, as Nicole said construction in early first quarter 2023 is a lot more likely than this October I'm very disappointed to hear that, Matt. I will, I'm, I'm willing to amend that part of my memo to say, expedite the contru construction timeline for prototype park to October, 2022 to prevent re-encampment of Guadalupe gardens or devise an alternate strategy that will ensure that site is secured by that timeline. Is that okay with my seconder? Thank you. Can this modified, uh, Councilman Cohen? Just a quick question for um, for Nicole or Matt, maybe both. <laughs> um, you know, we've been we have conversations, obviously, about timelines for for particularly a few key. Um, park elements in other parts of the city and in my district particularly. I just want to make sure that this isn't necessarily, just like in before, isn't necessarily changing timelines for other projects in the pipeline. And we've, we've, we've had a conversation recently about how disappointing we are, disappointed we are about one particular case. So I just want to make sure that, I mean, I don't, I don't, not against expediting work where possible, but not at the expense of things that have been in the pipeline for a period of time that, that we've talked about. Sure. If <clears throat> excuse me, if we were directed today to absolutely at every cost, no matter what, you have to start construction in October, then it would impact timelines on other projects. We'd have to put other things aside. Um, right now, based on the direction we're receiving, um, we're going to work on it as expeditiously as possible. But we're not going to put aside. We don't plan on putting aside any other formal commitments that we've made on other projects and other council districts based on what, the direction we're hearing today. I guess, uh, that, thank you. And, and Nicole, that, that you know what I'm referring to. I don't want to necessarily get into specifics. But okay. And I would say the challenge, like I mentioned, with, with FAA and a lot of the other coordination we need to do, we need to do for projects at Guadalupe Gardens, um, even if we were to get the direction to absolutely start construction by October, it, it would be, may not be possible given the challenge, given the coordination we need to do. But we'll still push it as soon as we can. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question, Mayor. My hands yes. up. Thank you. And so, Matt, while you're still there, 
things. Uh, didn't want you going. So I just want to clarify again, because I'm trying to, I, uh, so the most, so other projects will not be um, slowed down by the motion in front of us. Is that correct? Correct. I'm going to ask Nicole to please weigh in if, if there's anything she wants to add here. But right now we're focused on the dog park and expediting that as quick as possible and trying to get under construction earlier. However, first quarter of 2023, definitely getting under construction. Right now, based on our project manager's workload and other commitments we've made, um, we do have that planned out um, in the schedule. So that shouldn't impact any other project commitments. And that's not the plan right now. So um, and so the uh the languages or devise an alternate strategy, correct, to secure this. So um I I, I seconded Councilmember Davis's motion on this earlier, you know, if we need to do a fence or if we need to do is that the type of alternate strategy you're thinking of, Councilmember Davis? And and for clarification, I'm thinking of several months ago. So I'm just trying to understand this and the impact to other projects in the city. Thank you, Councilmember Esparza. Uh, whether it's a fence or whether it's the airport continuing to monitor that site um, or whether it's something I haven't thought of yet, I. Uh, I am agnostic as to the solution as long as there is an assurance that we don't see a re-encampment of this site while we are waiting for all of these uh, ducks to fall into a row. I may be able okay. to be of assistance here. So if you look at the Mayor Jones Pros Cohen Davis memo, item E, it says after residents have been rehoused, securing the site using K-Rail or other temporary physical barriers until construction of the prototype commences and activating the site with maintenance workers, resilience core, bridge participants, and regular police bike patrols. So that would be part of your approval, approved recommendation. So I think you're already there in terms of us securing the site until something else is built. Understood. I just, the purpose of the item, just to be clear to all my colleagues, is to ensure that we're doing this as expeditiously as possible. And to that point, again, just to be clear, as I have other sites, homeless sites in my district, I have other parks in my district, and I told Nicole and Matt both last week that if we need to put some of my other parks projects on hold to get this going faster, that's how important I think it is for citywide for this to happen here. So appreciate that you have other parks and other issues. I have other parks and other issues as well. I just think it's important for us to go all out on one site and to really honestly prove to our residents that we can do it. I'll, I'll share my perspective, which is I'm trying to find a way. I, I am supportive. And like I said, a few months ago, I seconded it seconded um, council member Davis's motion to put a fence because I thought we needed a fence and I agreed with her and we ended up in a place that had some flexibility in there. I, I don't think, um, I, I do think we have to add an equity lens. I, you know, we all have projects in our districts. I have uh, a project in my district where that has been languished for four years before I took office and it's in you know one of the most overcrowded low-income neighborhoods in the city and and if it came to it yes I would um, I would say that we need we owe that neighborhood service as well and and so um, so I'm trying to find a way to support um, work in this area while acknowledging that Guadalupe Gardens is pulling resources, um, from every council district in the city. And so that, that's my point. Um, if it's um, an issue with just being agnostic and being flexible about different ways about securing that site, um, that's something I can support. But I just want to explain where my questions are coming from because I do think, I do believe in equity and I do think we have to have an equity lens in some of the work that we do. And um, and I'm, I'm 
I want to be supportive of this. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Cohen, your hand is up. Is that from before? Okay. It's not happening anymore. All right. Um, Matt, uh, I don't have any questions for you. So if you want to run away before someone else does, <laughs> this is your chance. Uh, I'm, I was going to actually uh, ask a few more questions. Sorry to, to do this to folks, but uh, it's not related to this. I thought it was important to get that, the motion out first. Um, just a quick question about the Mayberry Yard closure, switching from talking about people to stuff now. Um, is it still closed and do we have any solution uh, or is that still a major it, choke point? It's back online. It was only closed for um, three to four weeks oh, due okay. to just a, a purchase order issue. Right. Okay. Yep, so that was January. Okay. I think the, the point we're trying to make though is, is going to weekly service and continuing, you know, each time we're here, we add more, add more. We're just producing a whole a lot, lot greater volume and it is exceeding the capacity of our existing infrastructure to do something about it. So right. that's that's kind of the flag we're raising in this issue. Yeah. Um, happy to see Trash for Cash seems to be uh, building. Really appreciate all staff's hard work in making that happen. I think we're up to more than 400 participants now. Is that right? And I, I know there's a lot of work, obviously, in, in that whole program. But is it doing anything to reduce, say, the calls for service or the the responsive, the reactive cleanup that we'd otherwise have to do? I can tell you that our cash for trash sites tend to be the cleaner sites. They tend to be the sites that get the fewest number of complaints. And all of our, um, all of the people in the program are happy to be in the program and really participate. They clean up kind of their area and they make sure the entire encampment area and right in front of it is clean. So they do a really good job. Okay. Well, that warms my heart to hear that. So thank you, Olympia, for all your work on it. And <clears throat> yeah, I hope we can have more conversations through the budget process. We've got a lot of things to have to spend resources on. We know to address this, this huge challenge. And if, if that's working, I'd love to, to water whatever's growing. Um, uh, Reagan, thank you for uh, all the, your team's work in housing 71 residents uh, in the GRP. You mentioned there were also nine vehicles that were repaired. What's the significance of repairing the vehicle? Does that mean that then somebody, are they staying there now with a functional vehicle or are they now on their way somewhere else? What does that ultimately mean to them? Yeah, it ultimately means that they're actively working on a housing plan to be somewhere else. And that part of that housing plan can be a safe parking site somewhere else, but, um, it does have to mean that they're engaged with Home First or another service provider to be working on a housing plan. Okay. We don't want to repair someone's vehicle and then see them park, you know, nearby. Right. We want to make sure that they're working on a plan for housing. So at the very least, they're very engaged in services. Correct. Okay, that's great. Um, and then uh, finally, the PTCOs are responding in vehicle abatement. And I know there's some challenges there because they don't have the authority to do a lot of stuff. And I, I don't know if maybe this is a better question to ask the Department of Transportation. Um, so this is probably not a fair question for any. Now I realize that I really should be asking this question from DOT. So I won't bug you guys with that question. Um, unless somebody wants to respond about PTCOs. I'm guessing not. Okay, I'll move on then. Uh, flag that on page 13, come back to it. All right, so uh, and then finally, we do have a $2 million grant that you guys were successful in securing for the source site at CDM. So I assume that could be leveraged to address some of the concerns that Councilmember Prowls raised in his memo, is that right? Yes, we did. Um received notice that we were awarded a $2 million grant from the state of California for what the state calls encampment resolution. Um, it's a new program for the state, but it is focused on 
uh, demobilizing encampments, but with a human-centered approach where we are um, working on housing solutions for the individuals in those encampments. So we did get an award um, to demobilize the encampment along um, Guadalupe River Trail from basically 280-87, right behind Children's Discovery Museum, going north to Arena Green. And there's about 100 folks that we counted in that area um, probably back in December was our latest count for that stretch. Um, I will say it's not immediate, so I'm not sure it aligns with Councilmember Perales's immediate need um, and that of the Children's Discovery Museum. We don't anticipate getting funding from the state until um, late summer or fall. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so thank you again. Thanks everyone. This is the hardest work in the city. I appreciate everyone's um, uh, really diligent efforts uh, in a very, very difficult set, set of circumstances. Okay, uh, we now have a motion. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlers? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8.1 is the fifth substantial amendment to the annual action plan for HUD. We do have a presentation. Reagan is here. All right. Good evening. Reagan Henninger with the Housing Department. Um, we do have a brief presentation this evening. Um, we are here for a fifth substantial amendment to our fiscal year 1920 annual action plan. Uh, we are proposing an amendment to this plan because that's the action plan where we recognized and programmed uh, some one-time emergency solutions CARES Act funding. This action redirects funds from two areas with lower spending rates and redirects funding to the emergency motel program for families, which is a highly utilized program. And uh, we do have a spending deadline, which is why we are um, proposing this amendment. Uh, and anytime we have an amendment where we're making changes to our annual action plan that are moving funds around that are greater than $100,000, um, we do have to have a public process. So we are reducing funds from the encampment trash program, which was spending slower than anticipated due to their hiring and ramping up of their staff. And then we are reducing our own administrative funding and then adding to the Life Moves Motel Voucher program. So uh, this is our second hearing. We were at the Housing Commission a few weeks ago, and there is a supplemental memo that summarizes their comments and questions. Um, and just a reminder, this is a public hearing to take uh, input on the proposed amendments to the plan. And uh, I will just underscore that we are moving around funds in order to meet our federal spending deadline. We don't want to uh, ever send money back to HUD. We want to keep it in our community. That concludes the presentation. Thank you, Reagan, and certainly welcome to see more dollars go to the vouchers. It's great. Um, okay, uh, we're opening the hearing. So uh, it comes to Stampede. Uh, I don't see anybody here in person. Uh, Tony, you want to go online? Claire Beekman. Hi, Ray Beekman here. Uh, stampede of one, maybe for this item. Uh, I, I, and in my stampede, uh, a very much of a thank you that you are uh, once again bringing uh, uh, federal HUD uh, funding questions to the public space. Uh, I would 
guess that um, I, I'm not positive, but I, this I don't know if it's part of this funding series, but uh, as a part of this HUD funding process, you had previously offered that uh, surveillance and technology ideas, basically uh, bridging digital divide issues, were going to be a part of this HUD funding. And uh, as always, my my role in life here is to remind of the importance of a uh, how open uh, and accountable practices and public policies can be of much help in, in determining uh, the success of, of the future of uh, bridging the digital divide. So good luck to yourselves, a reminder to work on these things, be aware and be aware of the public. And, and so having a public process for this is uh, great. Thank you. Back to the council. All right, thank you. Um, the hearing is now closed. Uh, I believe you need a motion, is that right, Reagan? Move approval. Second. Motion from Councilmember Foley, second from Councilmember Davis. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so our agenda is concluded. I wanted to note, uh, in addition to, uh, I appreciate the moment of silence that was taken by Vice Mayor and the Council. I believe the uh, flags will be flown at half mast for the rest of the week in honor of uh, Norm Mineta's passing. Uh, we'll go now to open session. Open forum. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for taking like uh, three hours basically on on the housing item and, and the future of how to address displacement issues. Uh, a real good luck to uh, government sponsored housing and how uh, it's helping define I think some of your questions at this time. Uh, good luck in that and it's efforts from all of us. And, and from that, but yesterday you had a really interesting item about uh, the future of uh, uh, housing issues and what exactly can be a, sequ a sequel process for that, a good sequel process. I, I, you had a really good memo for it yesterday. It was a really caring memo. And I, you're in a caring space <laughs> right now. And you're asking you know, difficult questions of yourself. And how can we move past, um, how, how, can, how can the future of housing not just be a matter of money itself, but, but real idealism from ourselves that we can all feel. And then from that place, we can ask the questions of money and, and you're asking in the right ways. So thank you for that. And good luck in the efforts in working on that. Uh, I had a few uh, short words uh, I'm trying to practice. I hope you can have patience. Once again, uh, as there's already been years of uh, open dialogue and negotiation for all sides about the future of the Ukraine area, including recent additional negotiation ideas, uh, as the UK, Ukraine can join the EU and that Russia can possibly return parts of the Georgia Republic, I hope we do not have to continue to rely on war, its harm and its displacement, displacement as the ways for people and countries in the Ukraine region to try to prove their mettle and points of view uh, before fully returning to the negotiation table. Uh, it's just my hope that uh, you know we can really work with a peaceful solution for all sides at this time, all sides should be able to want to work on that. And again, a, a helpful reminder that I hope we can think of life at home with issues like Paul Soto and, and we don't, he doesn't fall to the. Kirk Varton. Good afternoon, mayor and council. My name is Kirk Vartan. I want to continue to shine a light on the problematic and opaque process that is happening, happening around the city's gun ordinances. Next week, the ghost gun ordinance will come before this body for approval, yet there has been no outreach, no community meetings, and no discussion. The Silicon Valley Public Accountability Foundation has specific concerns on this upcoming ordinance, and we'll send them to you this week. I hope you will please review the comments with an open mind. The main concerns I have today are around the mayor's lack of outreach and community engagement. He brought the request for a dozen related gun ordinances to this council in June 2021, and it was unanimously supported. It gave direction to the city attorney to research and bring back ideas and ordinances. I think it was clear that this would not be done in a vacuum. Unfortunately, that is what is happening. The city staff is not tasked with community outreach, vetting, or engagement, and no one is doing it. 
and there is no notice, typically not even going to the Rules Committee. Mayor Licardo, you talk about community engagement, transparency, and outreach. You have done none of this. Everyone on this council should ask themselves, how many city-led discussions have we had on any gun issue? How many discussions or town halls has the mayor held? None, not one. I continue to ask to partner with the city and this council on bringing this discussion to the people in the city. Mayor, you have met with President Biden more often on gun issues than you have with your own constituents. Let's change that. Hold regular town hall meetings on gun ordinances you're proposing and talk to your constituents. Share your views on why they are needed. If you are so convinced these ordinances are appropriate, why are you so unwilling to discuss them in public with the community? Mayor Licardo, my offer to partner and collaborate is unchanged. You know how to reach me. Back to the council. Thank you. Uh, the meeting is adjourned.